to examine the operations of the General Accounting Office, or GAO. That agency audits and monitors all federal expenditures. The committee, which has jurisdiction over the GAO, reviews the agency's responsiveness to Congress's needs and explores the efficiency of the department's operations, employee concerns, and recent criticisms regarding the GAO's efficiency and professionalism. Committee will come to order. Good morning. We're having hearings on the General Accounting Office, oversight hearings, and we're here to really talk about one of Congress's most important functions, quality oversight. Uh, it's important. It's the uh, main responsibility for the existence of the Government Operations Committee, and we're delighted that the uh, General of the General Accounting Office is with us. There are a number of members that uh, have statements and have asked to testify. ...and undergo an even greater degree of scrutiny. There is a little selfishness uh, behind my argument for a strenuous review of the GAO. As the ranking Republican, I recognize that the success of the Committee on Government Operations is tied directly to the success of GAO. In fact, without the establishment of GAO, there might be no committee on government operations. When the Budget and Accounting Act of 1921 combined the six auditing offices of the Treasury Department with the Office of the Controller General to form the General Accounting Office, the Committee on Government Operations did not even exist. Instead, there were 11 committees on expenditures devoted to 11 different executive departments. These 11 committees were not necessarily beloved. In fact, when Alvin Fuller of Massachusetts resigned from the Committee on Expenditures in the Interior, he said that the committee was the most inefficient and inexpensive <laughs> barnacle that ever attached itself to the ship of state. That view was clearly aggravated after GAO was created because many members of Congress believed that GAO was now looking out for the interests of Congress and that 11 committees on expenditure were unnecessary and duplicative. As a result, on December 5, 1927, Congress abolished the 11 committees replacing them with a single committee, the Committee on Expenditures and the Executive Departments. Much of the work of the committee centered on the work of the General Accounting Office. In 1952, as you know, Mr. Chairman, the committee changed its name to the Committee on Government Operations. Like its predecessor, much of the committee's work continues to involve GAO. In addition to receiving and examining reports of the Controller General and reporting on them to the House, this committee, more than any other, utilizes the resources of GAO to assist in meeting its oversight and legislative responsibilities. That is why it is so important that we ensure a credible and objective GAO. We will soon be hearing from both critics and champions of GAO. I'm going to be listening closely to both perspectives. But to the critics, I would say, recognize the changes that have taken place over the last few years. While GAO's role in undertaking a secret October surprise investigation was truly, in my view, a low point for the agency, the fact remains that GAO now rejects secret and anonymous requests spending more than $17 million over a four-year period to pay for detailees to congressional committees was counterproductive and remains, uh, in my view, indefensible. Yet the number of detailees has been drastically reduced. New procedures have been instituted which require minority approval of GAO detailed personnel, and I believe we have nearly solved the detailee problem. Without excusing the past, we should all recognize those steps that have been taken to address previous shortcomings. To those who are championing GAO's cause, I would urge that you not view every criticism of GAO as rooted in partisanship. As is true in any organization, there is room for improvement. There are legitimate questions about GAO's audit performance, about personnel procedures, and about independence. If Congress is to depend on GAO for an independent analysis of federal programs, it is legitimate to question the role of GAO employees in shaping those programs and in participating in exercises like the National Performance Review. Refusing to recognize shortcomings will ultimately be counterproductive to GAO, to Congress, and to the American taxpayer. So, Mr. Chairman, with GAO and the Government Operations Committee so closely linked, it is all the more important that we don't let another eight years pass before the committee holds its next oversight hearing on GAO. So I would hope to work with you in an effort to ensure that we do this on a more regular basis. I look forward to today's testimony. 
want to thank our House and Senate colleagues for taking time out of their schedules to share with us their thoughts on the performance of GAO. I also want to welcome Controller General Bowser and to thank him for his cooperation with the committee in this undertaking. Thank you, Bill, for that long but important <laughs> uh, historical statement. <laughs> We're pleased to recognize now Henry Waxman, the gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to participate in today's hearing. Since coming to Congress in 1974, I worked closely with the GAO on a number of investigations, both as a junior member and in my capacity as chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee's Subcommittee on Health and the Environment. The late Senator Sam Irvin once wrote that the Constitution and statutes give Congress a solemn duty to oversee the activities of the executive branch. A major part of what our constituents expect from Congress is rigorous attention to whether existing laws are adequately enforced and whether new laws are needed to protect the public health, safety, and pocketbook. A vigorous GAO is critical to the ability of Congress to do its job. While GAO is an agency of the legislative branch, it is not a partisan agency. GAO performs a critical function in helping Congress analyze executive branch programs, policies, and the enforcement of federal law. Mr. Chairman, I know GAO has its critics. No one, particularly federal agencies, contractors, or state governments, look forward to an inquiry from GAO any more than they welcome an interview with Mike Wallace or a letter from you. I have certainly not agreed with every report or analysis prepared by GAO and do not expect to in the future. I do expect GAO to provide Congress with objective analysis by experienced, dedicated personnel. In this regard, I have not been disappointed. Officials of the Reagan and Bush administrations shared a characteristic with those serving in Jimmy Carter's. Few members of the executive branch appreciated the contribution of GAO to more efficient government until they left office. No doubt there will come a time, if it hasn't already arrived, when Clinton administration officials will question the usefulness of the GAO. GAO is an agency of the Congress, not the executive branch. The work of GAO has greatly enhanced Congress's ability to perform its oversight function. In recent years, our subcommittee has requested a number of GAO reports which have resulted in a remarkable record of enforcement actions, program revisions, or new statutes for the protection of the public health. GAO evaluations have been directly responsible for the passage of legislation to improve the safety and effectiveness of medical devices and made allocations of federal substance abuse block grant funds more equitable. GAO investigations have revealed administrative lapses in the enforcement of rules requiring the participation of women in federally funded clinical research trials. The inclusion of women in health research studies is now required by federal law. A GAO investigation of state drug treatment programs revealed that pregnant addicts were generally denied access to treatment programs. Federal law now requires pregnant women be afforded preferential admission to treatment programs. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses this morning and from the Controller General later in the week. I stand ready to work with our Republican colleagues to address legitimate concerns about GAO policies. Maintaining a strong and objective General Accounting Office will enhance the effectiveness of Congress and the public we serve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for an excellent but nevertheless long statement, Henry. <laughs> Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Al McCandless. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My statement is very long. I have no statement. <laughs> <laughs> Does the gentleman desire more time? <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Al. Chair recognizes Subcommittee Chairman Mike Sarner of Oklahoma. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend. Without objection. As the only member of Congress to take GAO on and win in the Supreme Court, Siner versus Bowser, I'm glad to be able to say that I can be objective about this very important issue that's before us. That said, let there be no doubt, I am a very strong supporter of the General Accounting Office. This agency literally has provided we in Congress <coughs> the opportunity to save literally 
billions of dollars of taxpayers' money. Let me just give you a few examples. Because of the GAO's work, the Department of Energy canceled the Hanford B plant on the upgrading plans that they had. Savings to the taxpayers, $600 million. Because of GAO's work on the new trinium reactor, that it was found that it was not needed. Savings to the taxpayers, $3.5 billion. Because of GAO's work with respect to the underground testing at the Waste Isolation Pilot Project facility, where they found that the testing was unnecessarily expensive and scientifically unsupportable, the DOE has now revised those tests. Savings to the taxpayers, $100 million. Because of contract management reforms proposed by GAO, we will literally save millions, if not billions, of dollars of taxpayers' money. In the concession contracts, by our Department of Interior and the Forest Service. Because of the GAO's work, we will literally reap hundreds of millions of dollars each and every year by better management. We will have more efficient energy management because of the uh, GAO studies, which again will save the taxpayers literally hundreds of millions of dollars. The bottom line is, is that the General Accounting Office has more than paid for its entire operation over the last past years in the work that it has done for just my subcommittee. Just my subcommittee. But the story still goes on. Right now they're working on things like the civilian aircraft operation and management within our government that can save us $750 million of taxpayers' money. They're reviewing the Department of Defense Hazardous Materials Inventory Program, which is going to save us millions of dollars. They're going to clean up the pathetic mess of EPA's pesticide and toxic chemicals program by recommending management techniques. They are helping us undo the unforgivable mismanagement of a $2 billion trust program at the BIA. And they are explaining to us why we have such a sorry state of the Superfund program. The list goes on and on and on of what GAO is doing. I'm confident that regardless of where we come down on this issue, that it is important that whichever party occupies the White House, it is essential to guarantee this agency's independence, objective, uh, objectivity, and ability to serve Congress. And I look forward to today's testimony as well as Thursday as a way to really put the record straight about the outstanding work that GAO does on behalf of not only this Congress but all taxpayers. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Sainer. Uh, we're delighted that we have uh, Senator Bond with us. Uh, we have a few more opening statements. I think your presence here, Senator, at the witness table will curtail the uh, length of time these statements will take, and uh, everyone can put them in the record uh, if they have additional comments. I'm delighted to recognize Steve Schiff, New Mexico, at this time. Um, I want to welcome Senator Bond. I just want to take a moment to congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, on holding this hearing. When the General Accounting Office rele re releases a report, it receives justifiably a great deal of congressional and public and news media interest uh, because of the position the GAO holds. Um, I think it's our obligation in this committee to work with the Comptroller General and other interested people to make sure that the quality and standards of those investigations and reports remains. Uh, at a very high level. So thank you for calling this hearing today. I yield back. Right. Steve Neal, gentleman from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. And I uh, just want to point out that I'm, uh, my primary committee is the Committee on Banking and Finance. And uh, I uh, think, frankly, we, we couldn't possibly begin to do our job without a strong, independent uh, general accounting office. They help us in hundreds of ways and have over the years. I don't, uh, certainly don't want to claim that any organization is perfect and cannot be improved. Uh, I wouldn't say that about the GAO, but I think by and large uh, they do their an almost impossible job extremely well. and. Uh, I uh, commend them for it, and I look forward to these hearings. Uh, if we can find ways of helping them do it better, fine. But I also want to say that they have helped uh, us help uh, our constituents in uh, hundreds of ways, and I appreciate uh, their fine efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Mr. Chris Shays has, uh, uh, may enter uh, his remarks later. We thank him. Gary Condit will do the same thing. Mr. Uh, Craig Thomas, the gentleman from Wyoming. 
Very briefly, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I sense your interest in brevity. Just a couple of – it seems to me there are some legitimate questions that we need to ask. And the one is how do you select the topics that are audited? And in fact, are there too many for the capacity? How do you resist uh, – studies that are simply there to legitimize the person who's asked for the studies, in ca most cases the chairman of a of committee? How do we insulate the auditor from members and the staff of members? How do we make sure that members have an opportunity to see the study before the hearings occur? And, uh, and then do we have expertise that's involved in, the, in these studies? So these are some of the questions I think are legitimate, and I look forward to hearing them from the... Thank you very much. Uh, chairman, sub Committee Chairman Colin Peterson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to commend you for holding this hearing. Uh, as a CPA, it's obvious I'd be biased in favor of uh, CPAs, and uh, I think that if uh, hopefully what we'll find out of this uh, hearing is that if uh, Congress and the administration would uh, listen more to the GAO and move on some of their recommendations quicker, uh, we maybe wouldn't have some of the problems that we uh, continue to have in government. Thank you for calling the hearing. Thank you. The gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. commend you for holding this hearing, and for the sake of brevity, I'll just add my remarks to the record. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentlelady from Florida, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Thurman. Good morning. Obviously, you can tell I'm a freshman, so. I can oh, say uh, that while I've not had much of an opportunity to work with GAO, I have had an opportunity to serve on the Joint Legislative Auditing Committee in the state of Florida. While I've not always agreed with them and didn't always like what they had to say, I certainly respected their opinion and gave it a great deal of thought when we were trying to put legislation together. I look forward to working with this, uh, with the GAO over the next several years. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, Mrs. Thurman. My, my thought was distracted because I hadn't recognized uh, Mr. Lantos of California, who I will get to right after uh, we reach uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Portman. Uh, I'll submit a statement for the record, Mr. Chairman. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, Tom Lantos, the distinguished former subcommittee chairman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you for holding the hearing, and I want to congratulate the Distinguished Controller General of the United States, Charles A. Bowser, for doing an outstanding <coughs> job, as well as his staff. Nobody loves a watchdog, Mr. Chairman, and uh, GAO functions as an enormously effective and cost-effective watchdog for the American people. I think in this uh, body we legislate much too much and engage in far too little oversight and without the GAO, our oversight would be infinitely less professional and less effective. I want to salute the work they have done, and I want to thank them in particular for the enormous help they gave us in our HUD investigation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentleman from Chicago, Bobby Rush. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also commend you on uh, your conducting of this particular hearing. Mr. Chairman, briefly, uh, in uh, myself, you have an unmitigated fan for the uh, services provided by the General Accounting Office. Uh, although my dealings with the General Accounting Office has not been extensive, I've been very pleased with their response to my inquiries. Uh, just this last May, Mr. Chairman, after being in office for five months, I asked the GOA, GAO rather, to review efforts by the Illinois Regional Transportation Authority to assess public transportation services in a portion of my district. At the time, the RTA was proposing to cut bus and rail service to my district. GAO responded promptly and, and quickly and thoroughly to my request. I was very pleased with their investigation. Mr. Chairman, in August, I received a briefing report from GAO that I would have to describe as being nonpartisan in nature. However, it was very thorough and I was excited to get this particular briefing. Mr. Chairman, this briefing report was presented to me and to the residents of my district by the GAO, dealing with a matter of life and death in terms of transportation in, their, uh, in, in my particular district. Secondly, Mr. Chairman, I must say this, the regional office of GAO has an extraordinary program which I was invited to participate in uh, this past spring. 
they take grade school children, eighth grade, and they actually have these children out doing investigations on different issues as it relates to the national agenda. They conduct investigations, they do research, and then they have a hearing similar to this hearing, Mr. Chairman, and I participated in that. And I just want to give you some of the uh, issue items that they dealt with. These eighth grade children from the purging school on the south side of the city of Chicago. They dealt with issues such as bank fraud, child abuse, meat safety, health care reform, homeless, homelessness, and railroad safety. This is the kind of personnel and staff that GAO have, and I tell you, uh, the, co the conduct and the hearing that those young students conducted was uh, exemplary, and it would really, Mr. Chairman, although I know that you are a great chairman, they are good competition for this committee. <laughs> Well, if, if you would forward their findings to the committee, we <laughs> may have some use for them. <laughs> Who knows? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Bobby. Uh, Mr. Christopher Cox of California. I thank the chairman. I will submit uh, a statement for the record. I, I will say that I am uh, interested to focus during these hearings on the size of the GAO. It has become, since the 1920s, uh, extraordinarily large. Uh, it right now has a budget uh, 21 times the size of CBO. Uh, and I'm also uh, interested in focusing on the number of reports produced. It strikes me that the volume, uh, nearly uh, 1,000 in fiscal 93, is so large that uh, the usefulness uh, is called into question. Uh, I would uh, appreciate the opportunity to submit my entire statement for the record. Thank you. Without objection. Uh, Mr. Klinger, unanimous consent. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I have cast unanimous consent that the following changes in subcommittee assignments be made effective immediately. Mr. Zeleth be removed from the consumer, Commerce, Consumer, and Monetary Affairs Subcommittee and reassigned to the Employment, Housing, and Aviation Subcommittee with designation of ranking minority member. That Mr. Horn be removed from the Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations Subcommittee and reassigned to the Commerce, Consumer, and Monetary Affairs Subcommittee that Mr. Portman be assigned to the Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations Subcommittee. These changes, Mr. Chairman, were necessitated by the departure from the committee of Mr. Makeley and the appointment of Mr. Portman to the committee. And I would actually ask that those be approved. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Uh, is Chairman Dingell in the House? Oh, John. Uh, Senator Bond has a vote in 10 minutes on the other side. Uh, and. Uh, with uh, that approval, Senator Bond, we're delighted that you'd come over here and join us in this inquiry. We would uh, recognize that your time is limited. We'll put your statement in the record and invite your additional comments. Welcome to government operations. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a pleasure to be working with you again. We had uh, some very difficult times a few years ago, but I uh, was most impressed by your <coughs> professionalism and, and capability in those activities. And, with you and Mr. Klinger, I'd like to say that I am also very grateful to you uh, for having the extremely important hearings on the GAO. Uh, as one who has served on the Legislative Branch Appropriations Subcommittee, which funds the GAO, I've had some opportunity to raise questions and discuss how the GAO and their policies and practices work. But it doesn't seem that we have done what you are proposing to do, which is extremely important, and that is to have a full-fledged hearing on the issue of, is the GAO doing its job? Uh, thus, I'm very pleased this uh, hearing is occurring. Um, for the record, I might tell you that uh, in the early 1970s, I served as state auditor for the state of Missouri. Uh, the experiences I had there and the lessons I learned uh, are one of the primary reasons I'm here today. I believe that every government organization needs a competent, professional auditing team which asks the tough questions, rattles the cages, and puts the facts on the table. Are the funds being spent as directed? Are the funds being spent efficiently? Where can improvements be made? These are basic questions faced by all auditors, and fair, impartial answers are what's expected. Unfortunately, I have to tell you, based on my experience, that today's GAO either uh, neither asks the right questions nor always provides fair and impartial answers. In fact, I think uh, maybe the opposite is the truth. Instead of looking for answers, I think they're asking for questions and then asking what answers should be preferred. That isn't what Congress needs. They don't need a yes man as an auditor. I'm not in a camp which believes the GAO has become 
an arm of the majority party. I do believe that GAO has become the lapdog of those whose services uh, are, uh, are sought. And I believe that they are prone to put out audits made as directed, coming to the answers uh, that are, are specified or implied by those asking the questions. Mm -hmm. Now, I come to these harsh conclusions uh, because of experiences which began on a report that seriously affected my state uh, very, potentially very adversely. I thought uh, their audit was unprofessional in and incorrect. Uh, let me be brief, but two specific aspects of the uh, first reports provide the best examples of what's wrong with today's GAO. The report I refer to is one which was issued on the Corps of Engineers' management of the water flow in the Missouri River. Uh, vitally important uh, to our state, uh, as this year it was uh, uh, extremely important. <laughs> but um, every year it is important to us. The audit was requested by upstream states anxious to prove that the Corps was mismanaging water releases during a drought. Um, the same states that were represented by the requesters had also filed a suit in district court challenging the same thing. So the GAO knowingly got in the middle uh, of a lawsuit over this question. The questions asked of the GAO were simple. Number one, determine whether in 1988, 1989, or 1990, the Corps followed a drought contingency plan in operating the Missouri River Reservoir System and whether the plan reduced water releases. Two, identify how the Corps set operating priorities for the plan. Now, I must confess that I was not surprised that the final GAO report concluded that the Corps followed a drought contingency plan, uh, that they mismanaged water resources, and that upstream tourist industries were being hurt because that's what the requesters wanted to prove. That's what they were seeking in the lawsuit and in the audit. But as my staff and I investigated the report, I found it claimed that the Corps was using outdated economic assumptions and that because of that, they were not paying enough attention to the economic impact of tourism. The GAO cited an early Corps estimate that 12 million tons of commerce would be shipped on the river and then concluded that because that figure had never been reached, the Corps was operating using outdated assumptions and that tourism upstream was adversely affected. Mr. Chairman, we pursued this phantom 12 million ton figure. Uh, and we also pursued why tourism was mentioned throughout the report when it was not mentioned in the stated purpose of the report. And uh, the answers we found leads to the disdain we feel today. In my efforts to track down the claim of 12 million tons, I asked the GAO to provide us with their rationale. And in their files, we found a 1985 law review article written by the then Assistant Attorney General of South Dakota, who was at the same time pro uh, prosecuting the lawsuit. Uh, it used that, that law review article, used the figure, footnoting it to a series of congressional committee reports in the mid-1940s. The article had been faxed to the GAO after the report was underway, but most interestingly, backup documentation referenced as sources for the article were not in the GAO's files. Some committee reports referenced were, but those referring to the phantom 12 million ton figure were not. This means, of course, that the GAO simply took the reasoning and conclusions from an upstate assistant uh, attorney general who was also pursuing a lawsuit against the Corps. They adopted it as their own and didn't even bother to get the supporting documents for their files. And even more outrageous, we've since learned that the auditor in charge admitted that she never read any of the legislative history that she had in her files anyway. Not surprisingly, given the GAO's inability to admit mistakes, the National Journal article on the GAO, which just came out, quotes them in response to my criticism as saying, quote, we went back and researched the whole legislative history, uh, close quote, uh, from Dexter Peach, assistant controller. But the mistruths of the GAO don't end there. In a hearing before the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on the Legislative Branch, I asked them why they addre addressed upstream tourism issues. They said it was a logical process once they began their work. I specifically asked them, quote, so it was not suggested that you ought to concern yourself with recreation, close quote. They replied, quote, no one directed us that we look specifically at recreation versus navigation issues, close quotes. Imagine, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, 
how I felt about the GAO when after this exchange, I was able to obtain a copy of the original quest for the first time for the study. And in that letter, it said, quote, specifically, we would like to know how recreational interests in North Dakota have been balanced with downstream navigational interests, close quotes. Now, I hope that I am the only member of Congress who the GAO has lied to in a hearing, but I'm not convinced that I am. Mr. Chairman, let me tell you the real results of my investigation into GAO's handling of this report. First, because the GAO only uses information in its files, most of which is given to them by the requester. If you have an interest in an ongoing study and uh, your interests are adverse to those making the request, you better provide the information yourself because they won't go looking for it. And you're going to have to take it on yourself to try to balance it out. Uh, this has meant that whenever we find the GAO is getting into uh, an area of interest to us, we try to provide them all the material that we need to make sure it is balanced. But I don't believe that's what Congress should have in mind as an independent watchdog. Uh, the members should uh, not have to follow GAO, GAO around to make sure that they get both sides of the story. Secondly, having watched them for the past two years, seen them up close in several episodes, I've come to the determination that you cannot trust their reports. There's no way to tell which reports are fair and professional and which are shoddily uh, prepared and biased. If in reports I really know something about, I find that they are shallow, inaccurate, and unprofessional, why should I trust their work in areas I don't know about? This has led to our policy of avoiding using GAO reports as sources for anything, even they, if they agree with or support our position. Frankly, Mr. Chairman uh, and members, taking on the GAO is not what I came to this body to do or to the Senate. And predictably, every time I've criticized them, I always hear the refrain, quote, he didn't like the conclusion of the report, close quotes, inferring, inter, inferring that that means that the criticism uh, is invalid. Uh, so how do you fight this response? Is it just sour grapes? Well, I inserted in the FY93 Ledge Branch appropriations a million dollars in order to have an outside audit done of the GAO's internal controls and procedures. We need to ask, what are the qualifications of the auditors? What internal review mechanisms exist? How are technical issues handled? Uh, what type of procedures are in place to ensure independence from the requester and any demands they may make? What are the measures for promotion and advancement? Who defines the scope of the request? Uh, the essential point which gives the audit its framework. Have any reports been retracted or rejected because they did not meet GAO standards? And what are standards for release? These are but a few of the questions I'd like to see addressed by an outside audit group, one with no interest in either side or prior acts to grind. I hope that the decision of the Rules Committee to provide funds for the Government Affairs Committee to have the National Academy of Public Administration conduct a study will provide some answers and guidance. But until then, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for holding this hearing and for giving me an opportunity to discuss my views of the GAO. Uh, Senator Bond, uh, there is another side to this story, obviously, and uh, you probably won't be here to hear it uh, because the uh, general will come on after the members of Congress. Um, could I hold myself out as an independent peacemaker uh, I, I know I can tell by, by your tone and your choice of words that this is a very slim read I'm on uh, this morning, but couldn't, couldn't we review this matter after we've had the opportunity that you have uh, to go into the kind of detail that you've presented to us today? Mr. Would you, Chairman, Would you I be willing to try? Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the offer very much, and I would, I would offer, I will have staff people available uh, uh, immediately to go over with your staff any questions you have. Uh, I would hope that what we have outlined would be, would be the way to resolve it. An independent agency with competence in public administration to take a look at the way that GAO is doing its business. Uh, if for no other reason than just the passage of time, I would think that an independent review by a competent, impartial body could provide this committee and the entire Congress with 
constructive suggestions. I believe we need a GAO, but I'd like to see a GAO that has uh, work that you can rely on and is not like Alice's Restaurant where you can get anything you want by requesting an audit. Well, I, I feel a little bit better because we uh, mutually agree that a GAO is, is needed and is necessary. Uh, let's, let's continue to work. I've got a pretty independent group here comprised of Democratic and Republican staff members, and I want us to take a look before we toss it to, uh, to the private sector. But I welcome your testimony. It's always good to see you, and we've been pleased to hear from you today. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Klinger. You're welcome. Thank you. uh, the chair is pleased to start off uh, the testimony among House members with the Dean of the Michigan Delegation, Chairman John Dingell. <coughs> We're welcome to uh, have the distinguished chairman of the Committee on Energy and Commerce again before our Government Operations Committee, and without objection, your testimony will be incorporated into the record. Uh, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time uh, describing your background, career, or accomplishments, and so uh, we'll dispense with them and allow you to have the maximum amount of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I thank you for the privilege of appearing here today. Second, I express to you my commendations for your inquiry into the conduct of the business of the General Accounting Office. I believe that it is a timely, necessary, and proper oversight function. The General Accounting Office is an arm of the Congress. And it is an arm of the Congress which was set up a good while back. Its function is to serve the Congress, to inform us of the facts, to gather data, to conduct audits, to look at the performance of government agencies, and to see how uh, the laws are being implemented, both in terms of expenditures of money and other things. I brought with me my dear friend, who is known to you and to many members of this committee, Mr. Finnegan, who is a member of the staff of the Committee on Energy and Commerce, who uh, uses GAO uh, services extensively, as indeed do I. Uh, I wish to first differ rather sharply with my distinguished friend, Senator Bond, over the behavior of the General Accounting Office. I cannot address every audit that they have performed over time, but I can tell you that the quality of the work which they have done for the Committee on Energy and Commerce is uniformly high, is unbiased, fair, impartial, and complete. Uh, they are an agency which was set up for the purpose of advising the Congress with regard to the, how the law is being implemented, how public monies is, are being expended, and a number of other things. In a very real sense, they are the eyes and the ears of the Congress. They are answerable to us. Now, if they're not doing the job, of course, clearly something has to be done to correct that. But I can tell you that the work done for the Committee on Energy and Commerce is uniformly high in quality and by the, by the General Accounting Office and has enabled us to conduct far better oversight than we have. Now, our committee is known for diligent and vigorous oversight of the agencies under the jurisdiction of our committee. We do not do as much oversight as is done by you, but we try to do it as well as is done by this committee. Well, Mr. Chairman, some think you do more than we do. <laughs> <laughs> You're kind, but I think that's not quite true. In any event, the GAO was founded in 1921. It has generally enjoyed widespread respect by both the Congress the executive branch and the private sector. Some of the edge has been lost in recent years, and I'd like to direct some of my thoughts to that. Uh, no administration and no Congress likes the GAO when they come forward and reveal faults or uh, come up with audits that cause embarrassment. Uh, not too long ago, executive officials called the General Accounting Office God's awful office. Well, that told me they were probably doing something right down in that agency. Now, uh, I think we ought to look to see what they have done over time. You will recall the Defense Department was not pleased in the 80s to see the GAO's revelations on cost overruns or the profligacy of DOD contractors with their hands deep in the public till. Well, they helped us cut enormous amounts of waste, fraud, abuse, 
and other misbehavior in, in the Defense Department. More recently, they've done a similar thing with regard to the Department of Energy, and still more recently with regard to the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, which seeks to become uh, a cabinet agency. And they've helped show how the contractors do a poor job. The, GA, the uh, EPA has totally lost control of the contractors, is spending money in ways which are not con in conformity with the law, uh, wasting enormous sums, and generally disregarding the basic function of that agency. Now, here are some examples, I think, that, that have properly chagrined the executive branch. They reviewed audits conducted on 19 Department of Energy contracts and subcontracts that were not completed but not closed out. In one contract, GAO found that the required audit was not conducted from 1983 to 1990. When finally uh, conducted, the billings of about 1.3 million were found, and in July of 1991, the DOE recovered almost all of that sum from the contract, uh, from the contractor, including more than $300,000 in lost interest. In addition to that, GAO reports on EPA's poor controls on contractor spending, which I uh, discussed earlier. The Congress rescinded some $24 million from EPA's fiscal year 1992 budget, set a limit on program management and costs in EPA's Superfund contracting program, where incidentally they have spent now something probably close to $20 billion, have cleaned up virtually nothing, and have, a, have an appalling situation from the standpoint both of public health, the environment, and quite honestly, public monies. Uh, we, we have observed extensive auditing in which they've engaged regarding colleges and universities and expenditures of public monies on research contracts. In one instance alone, con uh, Stanford University, on their federal research contracts, returned $1,030,117 to the U.S. Treasury. Other universities uh, have been encouraged by this to, uh, and, and by also GAO follow-on audits, to return additional significant sums, and a practice which probably over 10 years cost the United States in excess of several billions of, of dollars has been reformed. The GAO found in reviewing Food and Drug Administration regulation of good manufacturing practice that only uh, that of 175 foreign medical device manufacturers, 12% uh, of whom were exporting to the United States, had been ex inspected in one year. Now, they, they have uh, caused the FDA to commence a much more careful audit and inspection of those kinds of suppliers. Uh, for the and a, a result which is uh, brought back to this country not only significant health benefits but also greater protection of American consumers. Now we've asked them to review the Clean Air Act. <coughs> GAO found that the states and EPA are far behind the requirements of law regarding state implementation plans, submissions, and approvals, and they are they are helping us to guide EPA with regard to how it is. That EPA, that EPA should conduct and administer the, the Clean Air Act, see to it that the agencies uh, of the states carry out their proper responsibilities. Now, these are just a few findings. They've done, they've done valuable work for us on blood. The blood supply of this country is in good part made safe because of the actions done by the, by the General Accounting Office in terms of reviewing the actions of food and drug and other federal agencies with regard to the safety of the blood supply. They've done similar work with regard to generic drugs and have helped us to, to abate a, a disastrous situation in that agency in which there were, there were payoffs, uh, gratuities, and other things to federal employees for special treatment, uh, and leading to significant misbehavior and, and significant impairment of public trust just in generics. Uh, they, have, they have gone through the DOE uh, with regard to serious misbehavior by DOE contractors, which resulted in loss of, of safety uh, degradation of the environment and threats to the health of the American people. And without that, the Congress never would have had a, a reason to know how bad the situation is with regard to the Department of Energy, which is going to cost this country, because of poor conduct by the Department of Energy over the years, uh, is going to cost this country hundreds of billions of dollars. And in good part, GAO's audit of the behavior of, of DOE has resulted in a significant improvement and, and a beginning whereby the Congress can now start to clean up a seriously desperate situation in that agency. Now, GAO has a broad statutory mandate 
It's the uh, Act of 21, which established GAO, says it's an instrumentality of the United States government, independent of the executive departments. It is not like the Library of Congress, the Office of Technology Assessment, Government Printing Office. It is not a service agency of the Congress, but it does provide us extensive services. Now, there are a lot of people who would like to curb its independence by turning it into just a bunch of uh, green eye shade auditors uh, and, uh, quite frankly, a bunch of bean counters. That would be a prodigious disservice to all of us here. They accuse the GAO of unilaterally broadening its scope. In point of fact, the Congress gave the GAO a broad mandate in 1921. It required the GAO to investigate all matters related to receipt, disbursement, and use of public money to analyze the expenditures of each executive agency to help Congress decide whether public funds are used and expended economically and effectively, and to evaluate the results of a program or activity the government carries out under existing law. Now, these directives are 70 years old. They were devised by a Congress which knew its needs, was wise in seeking to address its responsibilities to the taxpayers to seeing to it that government policies are properly carried out, and, are, and that the laws are obeyed by the, by the executive branch and by the uh, those in it. Now, let's, we've heard a lot of complaints about GAO resources and how they are used. Quite frankly, their resources are really minuscule, particularly in, in relationship to the amount of work they're called upon to do and the benefit that the taxpayers receive from it. The numbers of departments when GAO was constituted in 1921 could be counted on one or two hands. The entire defense establishment was, was ensconced in the old War Department building, which is next door to the White House. The Pentagon hadn't even been built. There were no transportation, no veterans affairs, no energy or education departments. Agencies like EPA, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, National Aeronautics and Space Administration were not even, uh, not even imagined. Even the size and scope of the Executive Office of the President with its National Economic Council, Domestic Policy Council, White House Military Office, Office of Economic Advisors, Office of Management and Budget uh, virtually did not exist. As a matter of fact, there was in, in, in the early 30s a tremendous battle over whether Roosevelt was going to get three young lawyers who were going to be able to advise him in the conduct of the business of the President of the United States. So you can see that, they, that, that their responsibilities in terms of budget, which have grown from at that time something probably less than about six billion, are now well in excess of, of $1 trillion, uh, have grown in terms of monitoring both the numbers of employees, the number of agencies, and also the massive increase of expenses which are, which are em embodied in the federal budget. Today we have some 14 departments, a myriad of other agencies, and 30 offices alone within the executive office of the president. Now the National Journal on October 23 notes that the GAO's budget is one-sixth of the legislative uh, legislative staff, uh, uh, of, the, of the legislative budget. That's no intelligent comparison, and it tends to tell me that the, that the National Journal doesn't do a very good job of reporting to the Congress, or, and quite frankly, to their readership. Uh, as shown in, in a table which I've included in my statement, GAO's budget is only 0.16% of the budget of the Defense Department. It's 2.6% of the budget of the Energy Department, and 6.8% of the budget of EPA. That tells you that they don't have very much money or very many people to watch enormous expenditures of public money. Now, some people around these parts keep trying to cut the budget of the GAO, and they say this is fiscally responsible. This is the dumbest way that I know that this Congress can be fiscally responsible. Because here you are shutting the eyes of the Congress, you are closing its ears, you are taking away from it the ability to look to see what is going on inside the executive department, how public monies are being spent, and how the government's affairs are being con uh, conducted, including performance matters and others. Now, there's been a lot of talk about congressional domination. I want to tell you this is a lot of hooey. In the early 1980s, GAO did grow a bit timid in carrying out its statutory mandates. Until about fiscal 1985, only about a half of the GAO investigations and audits were based on congressional requests. Now, congressional requests are made by the Congress of that agency to perform, quite frankly, just bean counting auditing, or very frankly, to perform uh, some, something which is of vast more importance, and that is performance auditing. Now, a number of the uh, audits were self-initiated. They took a great, number, a great number of months, resulted in some broad and occasionally unfocused reports, and did not always include meaningful recommendations to the Congress. 
And quite honestly, many of these reports were simply filed while the Congress yawned and put them, put them in the file. Today, 82% of GAO investigations are congressionally inspired, including some which are required now by specific statutory provisions, such as Section 812 of the uh, uh, most recent amendments to the Clean Air Act. Now, each administration criticizes these things because they don't think the Congress ought to know about what's going on downtown. And I happen to think that we should because without it, we can't say that the policies are being carried out properly. You're spending money well. You're spending money wisely. You're spending money poorly. Here's where we ought to cut. Here's where we ought to give more money. And these are the, these are the defections from the policies that the Congress would have. Now, this, I would note, is a position which is entirely and I refer to the position that, that uh, people who are saying we ought to cut the budget of GAO is entirely inconsistent with the policies which were set out in the 1921 statute. And uh, that, that very plainly uh, directed the GAO to make investigations and reports ordered by either House of the Congress or by a committee of Congress having jurisdiction over revenue, appropriations, or expenditures, and to give committees of Congress having jurisdiction over revenue, appropriations, and expenditures the help and the information that, th that this body or the committee concerned might need. Now, clearly, congressional requests have got to be focused and not frivolous. They should not be partisan, and I want to address that as, as I go forward. We must realize that an oversight process that does not uh, that it rather does not necessarily commence with full, detailed knowledge of the facts. And a lot of times it comes in on the basis of information that the committee receives in somewhat fragmentary, fragmentary form. Now, the committee will only have a, a cursory knowledge of the matters that it asks the GAO to look into. And it's always been the policy of our committee that the GAO, as work progresses, keeps us informed so that we can know what the facts are. But we've always insisted that the work that's done by the GAO for our committee is on a let the chips fall where it may. Tell us what the facts are. Uh, we, will, we will address the other matters that flow from the facts. Our committee simply does not make requests then and sit back while the GAO investigates. We do watch the work to see to it that it is done properly, fairly, effectively, it's responsive, and it's done in a timely manner. I would assume that others in the Congress would do the same. I hope so. I'm not sure. But if they don't, they should. Now, uh, there have been some allegations made that the GAO favors majority members of the, of, of the Congress. Quite frankly, that's a lot of hooey. Uh, the, the charge has been made that GAO is not responsive to the minority. Now, the GAO has to be responsible, responsive to the Congress as an institution. It has to be responsive to committees, because those are the, those are the devices through, the Congress, through which the Congress functions. Uh, and in response to a question from me, GAO advised that as a matter of a policy, it assigns equal status to requests from ranking minority members and to requests from committee chairs. GAO adds that to the extent practical, it also responds to individual Democratic and Republican members' requests. These are not just words. I've attached a uh, uh, GAO prepared table in which uh, we've looked just to see what the Republican requests are that, that are made uh, and how they've been responded, uh, responded to. GAO has responded to requests from my colleague Mr. Archer of Texas, Mr. Army of Texas, Mr. Bill Arrakis of Florida, my dear friend Mr. Bliley of Virginia, Mr. Klinger, you've been the beneficiary of a number, and I'm sure you've enjoyed them greatly, Mr. Cox, Mr. Gil Mr. Gilman, Mr. Gingrich, Mr. Gunderson, Mr. Horton, who served on this committee with such distinction, was, was, a, was a frequent user of the services of the General Accounting Office. Mr. Ireland, Mr. Klug, Mr. McCollum, Mr. Nussel, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Wolf, Mr. Young, and many, many more, and a large number of uh, Republican senators, including a good friend, Mr. Bond, who was here before you, who uses their services not infrequently. Now, on October 8, the Washington Post reported U.S. taxpayers are, reporting, are facing a bill of $1.1 billion too high for new and remodeled courthouses, according to a GAO report. That report was requested by our good friend Mr. Inhofe, who is a Republican member from Oklahoma. Now, let's talk about DTLEs, because I've heard a lot of complaints about DTLEs, and I think we ought to look at that and lay that, lay that matter to, to a solid and, and permanent rest. Now, uh, by way of example, D, G, uh, GAO DTLEs have been critical to the success 
of Oversight and Investigations Subcommittee, which I chair. Their work has returned enormous di dividends to taxpayers, financial and otherwise. They, for example, did a major part of the work on the Boski and Milken scandals, which led to uh, proper sojourn by deserving Americans in uh, proper federal repositories where they stayed for a goodly period of time. They also did some, they also did some very fine work on the, uh, on, on, on the bank problem and on savings alone. And they showed a tremendous number of defalcations uh, in connection with, with those matters. Regrettably, the Congress didn't respond to those matters as they should in, the, in a punctual fashion. But their efforts as detailees have saved the taxpayers literally millions or billions of dollars. And they've been central in prodding the FDA on regulation of medical devices, surveillance of imports, regulation of blood supply, and on importation of shoddy, dangerous, contaminated, and unsafe foods. Now, our committee uses detailees, and I want to make this very clear, in a bipartisan matter. From the moment that the letter goes to the GAO requesting a detailee, the Republican staff on the subcommittee is kept fully aware of the detailee, his functions, and his assignment. And they are kept fully informed of the matters on which the detailee is working. Because a copy of the correspondence is, is provided uh, to the minority, and because staff interviews, which are conducted in concert with the work of the detailees, the, uh, the, uh, are done in a bipartisan manner, uh, the minority is keenly aware of the work of the GAO detailees on behalf of the subcommittee. Now, so I, I want to lay that permanently and totally to rest. The executive branch and some in the Congress criticize the uh, GAO for not sharing the drafts of the reports uh, prior to formal comment. Now, I would, I would think that we ought to take a hard look at this because uh, the quality assurance is of the report is not a responsibility of the people that are being audited uh, to, to say we're going to let them dictate how the report is done and what are its contents is kind of like putting the fox in charge of the hen roost. Not a hen roost. And I would, strongly, I would strongly object to anything which would say that the, that the GAO must submit its audits to the people that they're auditing for correction and reform. Now, one of our colleagues, Mr. Lightfoot, accused the GAO of bowing to the administration under pressure to tone down a report on payroll practices at the White House. He contends that, this, that, that the GAO draft was more critical than the final version. I would agree with Mr. Lightfoot. The White House should not have gotten that uh, device for a perfect purpose of review. Now, the executive branch has long viewed the GAO as an, as an, as an adversary. And I would say that if that is the case, that, that tells me that they're doing the job we're paying them to do. And although we might have occasional criticisms with regard to the to quality of particular work or particular audits, I say that, that overall that tells us that they are doing the work. Now, I want to give you another example. We asked the GAO to make a comprehensive review of the Rail Safety Enforcement Activities at the Federal Railroad Administration. Now, the Reagan administration denounced this. And uh, it was indicated that this was going to be a terribly partisan undertaking. The practical result, however, was that when President Bush, following his elected election, appointed a distinguished Republican by the name of Gil Carmichael to serve as FRA administrator, the agency's attitude underwent a startling change. And an agency which had been somnolent, indifferent to the questions of rail safety, all of a sudden got to be interested. Mr. Carmichael was positively excited that he, that he could get GAO to perform free audits and to give his agency advice, a, advice which he regarded as being extraordinarily good, which he implemented, and which resulted in not only a significant improvement in the performance of the, of the agency, but in a, a remarkably close working relationship between GAO and FRA. And as a result, today, FRA's rail safety program works better, and FRA, under a Republican administration, developed a much more positive and cooperate, cooperative working relationship with a Democratic Congress and a committee chaired by a Democrat. Now, there is an area of concern. GAO does take a while to get their work done. And that is something which I think ought to be addressed. But I don't think, in fairness, we should denounce them for the fact that they're working as hard as they can with the, with the rather limited resources. Now, last of all, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say we are getting ready to, to file a 
uh, or rather to release a GAO audit today. It will be done by Mr. Moorhead and Mr. Dingle, the chairman and the ranking minority member of the Committee on Energy and Commerce. We have conducted this, this work in cooperation, as we always do, and we are, we are releasing it in, in full cooperation. And I would just say that, that uh, as we address these problems of the GAO, we recognize that, that they are our eyes and ears. They serve us. They tell us what's going on. They look for rascality, misbehavior. They look for mis-expenditure of public monies. But they're never afraid to tell us that somebody is doing a good job. The problem is that they aren't really given the opportunity to look at folks who are doing a good job because, quite honestly, we've got enough rascality we've got to look at that we simply don't have time, have, have time to go down and tell us that so-and-so in such-and-so department is doing a good job. But if you talk to the newspapers, you'll find they've got exactly the same right, the same, uh, the same outlook. They spend their time looking for wrongdoing on the part of members of Congress, senators, uh, and, and, and people in the executive branch. And they, they'll tell you, quite frankly, it's not their business to write nice things about folks in, in public life. Well, GAO doesn't have either the personnel or the money to do this. In any event, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have appreciated your kindness and courtesy and hospitality. I regret I've taken so long, but uh, this is an important matter. Uh, at stake here is literally how the Congress is going to get the facts that it needs to legislate well. If you crimp, curtail, hurt, or reduce the ability of the, the GAO to serve us, to gather the facts and the information we need, you're going to find that this institution is going to be significantly hurt, and that members on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, the institution itself, and all of us collectively as, and, and as individuals will be significantly hurt if we don't treasure and protect and guard an agency which serves as our eyes and ears. We want you to know, Chairman Dingell, that uh, many of the practices that you referred to with reference to your committee that you have chaired for a number of years are emulated by this uh, committee as well. Uh, we work as closely uh, with Mr. Klinger as I worked with Mr. Horton in the assignment of detailees. Uh, most of my requests to the General uh, Accounting Office uh, is accompanied by Mr. Klinger's signature or else Mr. McCandless on the subcommittee uh, that I chair within the Government Operations Committee. And I think you've, you've uh, made an extremely detailed and penetrating assessment because I think it's fair to say that uh, EPA and the Department of Energy are two committees within your jurisdiction. And so the examples that you have proffered here this morning are based on your absolute experience, uh, not only uh, this year, but across the years. And we're, we're grateful to your helpfulness in that regard. Um, we, uh, d does any members have any comments for Chairman Dingell? Chairman. Mr. English. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I simply want to say, uh, uh, Chairman Dingell, I too uh, uh, have had the opportunity to use GAO as a subcommittee chairman in the past, and your observations I would totally agree with. Uh, uh, that was, uh, I found that their work to be very good. Let me just say, though, there is a, an area of criticism that, uh, that I do have of the GAO, and I'd like your observation with regard to it. Uh, that area is, is something that has occurred uh, uh, recently within the, the past few years. It appears to me that uh, given the attack that uh, GAO has come under by some quarters, some members of Congress, I might say, uh, that uh, uh, it, it does appear that this is a having an impact as far as taking the edge off of some of the GAO reports, where in the past they were a good deal sharper and, uh, and more to the point. There does seem to be a, 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 a mellowing uh, uh, impact as far as the result of these reports. Maybe it's coincidence and maybe not. Let me also say very quickly, I have not always agreed with the information I've gotten back from GAO, and I've certainly disagreed from a policy standpoint from time to time, but as you say, their work is very good, and I've never questioned their objectivity, even though we may be on different sides. But I'm very concerned that uh, the attacks that GAO has been coming under is beginning to have an impact with regard to the sharpness of the reports that we get back from GAO and we're getting a, a, a feel, at least in some cases, of some fence straddling. Uh, have you any observations with regard to that? Well, I think your observation is a very perceptive one. 
First of all, I've noticed that, that there is some loss in sharpness at GAO. But I would observe it's pretty hard to not only take on all the vested interest in the executive branch, but quite honestly out there amongst the government contractors, uh, be continuously denounced by them and still be vigorous, focused, and aggressive in, 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 your, in your approach. Uh, I will tell you this, that, our, that, that there is a standard procedure for handling the Subcommittee on Oversight Investigations when we have an investigation. First is to attack the, first is to attack the committee. Second is to attack the staff. Third is to attack the, the people who do the work, either the Inspectors General or the General Accounting Office. And I, I find myself hard put to uh, understand how it is that the GAO can persist in its work given the constant attack and the constant carpeting, most of which is totally without merit and, and a fair amount of which is both spiteful and vicious and quite honestly did, uh, done to strip the Congress of its ability to know what's going on. Well, I think we should be, uh, particularly those of us who uh, have used the GAO a great deal in the past and appreciate the fine work that they have done, uh, I think that that's something we've got to be concerned about. And I recognize human nature after uh, you're, you're attacked sharply. Uh, uh, there is that uh, human tendency, I think, to uh, perhaps um, uh, question your own uh, uh, statements and actions. But in this case, I think we've got to take uh, some kind of action, uh, Mr. Chairman, to make sure that uh, GAO not only retains, regains that edge that they've had in the past and that uh, they've got to understand that their job is to uh, uh, call it the way they see them and in uh, and, and no way to try to sugarcoat it or in no way try to, uh, uh, to uh, provide balance. I think they've got to you know, let us know exactly the way they see it and they've got to lay it out and only in that way can the Congress be best served. And, and that's what concerns me a great deal about the attacks that we're hearing. I think the GAO is to be commended, and I think, uh, quite frankly, uh, we as members of Congress have got to make sure that they understand the full support they have by the overwhelming majority members of Congress. Thank I, you, I, I agree with the gentleman, and I thank him. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Hastert is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, my other Mr. Chairman is uh, <laughs> sitting at the table. And I, I just think, in a sense, that we need to bring another perspective to this thing and some balance to it. I've sat through <coughs> government operation hearings for seven years that I've been here. And uh, in a sense, this may sound, Mr. Chairman, a little partisan. But we sat usually at a deficit in, in, with committee force and the ability to do the research and do the work. And uh, for a number of years, I've seen uh, GAO detailees come to committee chairman, committee chairman have an agenda, want to go through, certainly uh, a lot of those years we're defending a, an administration, sometimes justly, sometimes uh, on a partisan basis, but not only being out, outmanned, but also having GAO, GAO detailees sitting behind a chairman, doing the investigation, writing the questions, coming back and providing the answers to those questions and it's a pretty stilted situation. And there's a point, uh, again, you have to look at it from a perspective of somebody in a minority, that enough's enough. And to listen to this tilting of, of reports uh, to fit what the desires are of people going on quests uh, is more than uh, sometimes is palatable. And I have to say, with all due respect, uh, to what this committee, and certainly what your committee, because I am bought into the program of what you're doing, but it's tough to bring balance to that uh, from our perspective. And so sometimes with the GAO, uh, a quest of dotting I's and or crossing T's and putting accounting data in, in little boxes and not looking at the big issue and tilting the whole credibility of a program uh, whether it might be in the Department of Energy or it might be IRS, or whatever the role is, and I've had experience in both those types of reports, you know, that has, doesn't look at the big picture at all, but just discredits a program because, you know, not uh, everything fits into an accountant's world. And uh, the, you know, the, that is a very tilted presentation that I've seen, and I've spoke out against that. And so there are those uh, of us who sometimes raise questions. I think that's legitimate to raise, raise questions on both sides of the aisle on the legitimacy of what those GAO reports. And I'm one member that uh, 
at some point fed up with that tiltedness and listening to it and having to deal with those folks over there uh, and not being fair and honest uh, with, with the reports. Thank you, Mr. Would Chairman. You yield to me on I, I've, I've been conducting, you know, I've been conducting congressional investigations since about 1960. And I've investigated Republican administrations, and I've investigated Democratic administrations. And I don't remember any one of them that didn't make the same kind of complaint that we were investigating them, and they didn't like it, and they didn't like what we found, and they'd attack the GAO. And now, we're, we, during the time the gentleman served here, we've had a Republican administration investigate. That's been great fun. I've enjoyed it mightily. Uh, and, and, now, and now we're going to have a Democratic administration. And that's going to be great fun. And we're going to, we're going to investigate them. And that's going to be great fun. And I just, I just don't think that you ought to think that the Congress sits here and, 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 and carefully cooks things. There may, be, there may be an occasional member that does that. There may be occasional chairman. But you look at the work product of our committee, on which you serve with great distinction. You will find at the oversight subcommittee that, that our business is conducted in an open, bipartisan fashion. Yes, we have detailees, and we use them. And they work like hell, and we expect them to. And we, and, and we insist that they, that they come forward and they tell us what's going wrong. And if, if a witness comes before the committee under oath and tells us something that ain't true, I expect him to tell the chairman that this guy's not lovely with you, Dingle, and here is, here is what's wrong so that we can ask him a few helpful questions and sort of bring out the full picture and the truth. And what I would say to you is this. I've investigated Republican administrations. I've investigated Democratic administrations. I can't recall the first one that liked it, but I can't also recall an instance that our committee has conducted an investigation where, where, where our work has not been fully vindicated, where the efforts of the GAO people have not attack, attracted honest admiration on the basis of the quality and the care of the work they did, both when they were conducting their investigations for the committee and doing their audit work, and the work of their people who worked with us on these matters. And, you, you know, our, 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 you, you will find that there has never, I can't recall an instance where the Republican members of our, of our oversight subcommittee have once criticized an investigation in which we have been engaged. Uh, and, and, and in each of those, the GAO and the, and the inspectors general have been an, an intrinsic part of that work, both in terms of, of occasionally detailees and occasionally um, the, and, 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 and almost invariably the quality work that they did in the audits. And, and, and let me just tell you something. For example, we investigated uh, some matters in the securities industry that, which led ultimately to the collapse of the Drexel Burnham Lambert uh, in, in investment house. And they quite frankly should have collapsed uh, because the practices in which they engaged were absolutely outrageous. Uh, and we had, we found somewhere between 2,500 and 25,000 felonies involved in the way they handled, not insider trading, but insider accounts, which are different. But there's the same wonderful opportunity for rascality in either instance. And what I'm saying to you is that without the help of, of the dozen or so GAO people we had detailed to do that work, we would never have been able to bring that to a conclusion. It was done in full cooperation with, with our Republican colleagues who were kept fully informed of it. And the result was that the SEC came forward with some significant changes uh, in the way it deals with those kinds of matters. And quite honestly, uh, a firm which was engaged in some very shameful practices, not around engaging those shameful practices, and some of the deserving folks in that firm have gone to jail where they could reflect on their wrongdoing. Gentlemen. Uh, the gentleman seek time. Uh, Mr. I ask Mr. Hatcher to be yielding me. Yield I could reply just for a second to the distinguished chairman of, of Energy and, uh, and Commerce. I uh, certainly don't take umbrance or going to debate uh, with you. I, I can't do that. I have great respect for the gentleman. And what I'm saying also is that uh, my experience, and, and when I have thought I've seen fault, I've spoken up, and never once in Energy and Commerce, it's been in this committee where we've had that experience, that I just think there's some times when there's, there is need for criticism, and it should be talked about, because I think, uh, I come out of a situation, when I was in Illinois General Assembly, I was, I ran the Illinois Legislative Investigative Commission. I had seven investigators. I know 
what you have to do. I know you have to look into government and do those things, but I think when that happens, it has to be balanced, and I think there's some times when it's not balanced, and I think that criticism needs to be out there. On that, on that basic point, we're in full agreement, and I don't think that there should be wrongdoing by GAO or a congressional committee or an individual member or a committee chairman or whoever he might have to be. And I think on this, the gentleman and I are in full accord. But, but, and I have, and I want, I want the gentleman to know I have enormous respect and affection for him. He's a very valuable member of our committee. But I just, I just, I just have to. He have was a va this. very valuable member of our committee too, Mr. Chairman. Well, give, give, give us more of his services because we want him over there as much as we have. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, these, these are, these are questions have to be addressed carefully. I can, I can only speak on behalf of, of one committee and describe what goes on there. But I'm sure the same high-quality work is seen here in, in the labors of this committee and its, and its subcommittees, too. Gentlemen, you, I, I just, I, I want to say again, I want to stress this. The reports that I've gotten back as I've chaired a subcommittee from the General Accounting Office, I have not always agreed with the information sent. You know, it's, at times it clashes with what my own perceived reality is or what I think should be done. But that still does not persuade me that just because that report is in a disagreement with my own beliefs that I should ignore it or in some way that it's being colored or changed or in any way. Now, I can certainly appreciate uh, uh, and, and understand, I suppose, if, if one uh, somehow sees that as, as some kind of conspiracy between the majority and the GAO, you know, perhaps uh, I would have felt differently about it. But quite frankly, you know, I, I, I had a little different perspective. But the fact of the matter is, they don't always agree with me. They don't always do what I think they ought to be doing. And certainly in the reports that come back, let me say on the other hand, though, I have felt exactly as the gentleman has felt for the last 12 years under Republican administrations. There have been issues that I've been involved in. I've had exactly the same kind of perception that evidently he has with re regard to the GAO. And maybe that has something to do with the fact that, that uh, you know, we're, there, is a, uh, there is a difference in ideology. There is a difference in philosophy. There is a difference between the political parties. And, that, you know, that's what we're dealing with. Let me also say from the other side, that uh, as far as staff people, as people in, in carrying out uh, an, an ability to, to try to investigate and get to the bottom line, the truth of the matter, you know, those 12 years, that administration had far more people than I had at my disposal as a subcommittee chairman or in with the GAO. There's no way we could match the number of people. So, you know, there is, a, there is a balance to be struck. And let me also say that I've had detainees, people that have been uh, provided by GAO, when I'm on the government, uh, excuse me, on the Agriculture Committee, we were getting the Commodity Futures Trading Committee, which was a very complex issue and involved federal investigations. And they did excellent work. And, you know, I can't say enough about the fine job they did. So, and as far as I know, certainly, as the gentleman knows, when he was a member of my subcommittee, Anyone that had any work that they wanted done by GAO, I was delighted to see that done. As far as I know, the chairman has been willing to provide detainees from GAO anytime anybody's requested. All they have to do is make the request. So, you know, I think a lot of what happens, perhaps it's perception versus reality. And what we think we would like to see come back in a report doesn't always come back. And unfortunately, what we believe is the truth ain't always so. Sometimes it's different, and thank God we've got GAO to clear the thing up so that at least we can at least tie to some semblance of the truth around here sometimes. Well, Chair, thank thanks to the gentleman from Oklahoma and the gentleman from Illinois, who is a valuable member of this committee, Chairman Dingle. I want you to know that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You worked with us uh, and, and thank immensely you well. Thank you also, members of the committee. And I, again, I want to reiterate my comments don't indicate the smallest lack of respect or affection from a friend, Mr. Hassard, who is Mr. a very Chairman. valuable member of this body, and I have enormous respect for him. Who seeks? Mr. Cox. Uh, uh, sure. Before the uh, distinguished gentleman from Michigan and the distinguished chairman uh, leaves, I just would address a, a couple points from his testimony. Uh, you mentioned uh, to illustrate that uh, GAO reports were issued uh, 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 on an even-handed basis to Democrats and Republicans, that they are issued uh, 
first uh, to committees uh, and also uh, to individual members, and then you read names of individual members who had requested on the Republican side uh, uh, GAO reports, and you mentioned that I had. Now, I don't know about the uh, validity of the rest of the list, but I haven't requested such a report, so your list is in error to that degree. Uh, well, second, it, may be, it may be you did it alone, or it may be you did it in concert with others. These, the only these, uh, uh, these time my name has ever appeared on a GAO report is, uh, to my knowledge, this one here, which was sent to, to a number of committees, and it just listed all the names of the chairman and the ranking members and so on, but uh, it was not a request that I made, certainly. Uh, uh, second, well, I, uh, I'd, I'd like to come to the defense of services board. <laughs> well, perhaps so. I just uh, uh, point out that perhaps the information that you've been supplied, either by the GAO or someone else, might not be accurate. Uh, second, to, to no. defend the National Journal uh, and the reporting concerning the size of GAO relative to uh, other congressional staff, uh, I don't think it's fair to say that uh, compared to the Pentagon, gee, it isn't that big. It's a little bit like saying that uh, uh, compared to the distance from this hearing room to the sun, Baghdad is one one millionth the distance, and therefore we could walk there for lunch. Uh, the fact is that uh, with uh, 5,000 staff, uh, GAO does comprise uh, roughly one quarter of all legislative staff. And I know the, the chairman's view because, uh, as you know, I have brought an amendment to, uh, in successive years to the floor during our legislative appropriations debate to limit the annual spending for GAO to uh, one-third of a billion dollars. And the chairman, I recall, uh, in his summation uh, in opposition, suggested only a knave, a thief, and a scoundrel could vote for such an amendment. But uh, uh, I continue to believe that uh, it is uh, uh, very, very large. And I'd just point out that uh, uh, we have grown very, very much in recent years. Uh, GAO grew 14% from 358 to $409 million from FY 1990 to 1991, and another 8%, 409 to $443 million from FY 1991 to 1992. This year's 1% cut, it seems to me, hardly singles, signals a change of direction. Uh, the budget is still twice the size of the Library of Congress, eight times the size of CRS, ten times the size of OMB, and 21 times the size of CBO. Uh, I think the National Journal is right on. Well, let me, let me go here. I've taken a look here just quickly at the, at the list. First of all, it, in, on 7-31-92, there was a review requested of the independent counsel, Lawrence Wal Walsh, and offices of the independent councils. And that was requested by Ms. Mr. Allen, Mr. Army, Mr. Burton, Mr. Callahan, Mr. Coble, Mr. Mr. Cox, Mr. Christopher Cox, Representative Cunningham, DeLay, Duncan, Gingrich. Uh, so I'm sure you did. It might just have slipped your mind. Uh, but let's, let's look at GAO because I think. But if the chairman will yield, uh, I, I might respond. I've, we've asked GAO. Uh, for both 93 and 92 uh, to tell us uh, how many of the reports that have actually been issued were in response to Democrat requests and Republican requests and how many have been jointly requested. In 1992, 644 reports were issued, according to the GAO, in response to Democrat requests, 42 in response to Republican requests. So to repeat that, 644 Democrat, 42 Republican, 73 were jointly requested, 91 were mandates and reports to officers, and 44 were issued by the GAO without request on a partisan basis. Well, I think you've got to understand that, that, that around here, the people who are in charge of running the committees are Democrats. It just happened that, the, that, well, that there are more I of think us Mr. around Mr. here, this and, is and the it was our job to organize to the House, and we're responsible for conducting the business of the House. And I, I, I hope you aren't offended if we occasionally request a GAO audit, because uh, we think it helps us all. And in our committee, the, these audits are shared by the chair, and I'm a requester of a large number of audits, uh, by the chair with, 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 the, with the entire membership of the committee. And quite honestly, in, in most instances, you will find that, that, that the senior Republican, either on the committee or the subcommittee, is a co-requester of these matters in our, in our committee. Now, I can't tell you how other things are done. But you talk about the, about the relative size of GAO and how they've grown. I, I have to say that if you're going to stop rascality in government, 
by government contractors. You're going to see to it the laws are faithfully carried out. You've got to have GAO. And you've got to have somebody who will do the auditing, both in terms of bean counting and the green eye shade type of work, but you also got to have a guy or a group of people who are going to do the kind of work that you have to have in terms of performance audits. Because the performance audits oftentimes are ever bit as important as the other things. Now, you can, you can tell it that they've got, a, they've, got a, they've got a fifth or a quarter or 25 percent or 50 percent or 95 percent of the, of, the, of the staff that's available at the House or the Senate. But that's, I reiterate, that is not the yardstick that you should be using in terms of, of, of looking at the workload that the GAO is called to carry, carry forward. GAO only has 0 0.16 of the budget and the number of people they've got at the Pentagon. And they only have a small fraction of, it, 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 uh, just a percent or two, of the number of people or the budget that you have in the agencies that they're supposed to audit. I think the chairman now, just misspoke. Auditing. You meant to say that the fraction was of the budget, not of manpower, isn't that right? Budget, okay. manpower, pick, pick it, take, it, take it any way you want. Well, I think it makes a significant difference. If we compare budgets of similar service organizations, we might learn, for example, that uh, Price Waterhouse, one of the nation's major accounting firms, in fact, one of the world's major accounting firms, spent less on all of its managerial and financial audits last year than did GAO. I, I'm, I'm, I don't find that to have any relevance to anything. I think it's directly comparable uh, if, if, as if compared look, to the Pentagon. If you, look, if you look at some of the major U.S. accounting firms, you will find that they have enormous, enormous lawsuits pending against them because of shoddy work that they've done. Uh, and, and, and we've investigated accounting and accounting practices in this country, and we found that there's about $145 billion in outstanding, in out, $145 billion, not million or thousands, in outstanding lawsuits against major accounting firms uh, some years back. Mr. Chairman, that's because but, in the and, private and, sector there is Chairman, liability I, for financial that's statements. That's, because they, do, that's because they do sloppy work. And, and, and the practical result of that was that, that, that in an in instance where they settle it, they have the settlement sealed till three days past the end of time. Now, I think, I think your number here is, is really important. GAO's got, got 4,800 people. EPA's got 21,000, but then they got the contractors. DOE has got, I don't know how many thousands or millions but then they've got the contractors, and Christ alone knows how many people a contractor's got working for them, a fair number of whom are diligently trying to skin the taxpayers. And a similar situation occurs both at DOE and DOD. And you've got to have people here at GAO who will go out and, 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 and help us ca catch wrongdoing, make money be returned. GAO, GAO's total, uh, total budget's about $800 million. Every year, for our committee, they help us catch about $2 billion. And if this committee performs as well as I think that, that you do, you catch a whale of a lot more because you've got a bigger budget and a much broader jurisdiction. And so I w I w I'm one of those curious fellows that regards good auditing, good accounting, uh, good, good congressional oversight as a good investment of the taxpayer's money, not as a waste of money. Uh, Chairman, Chairman Dingle, we, we have a smaller budget but a larger jurisdiction. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to Mr. yield Chairman, back I... uh, my time, but just to, to conclude, uh, I would get back to this point on which I opened uh, concerning partisanship. Uh, at various times, uh, the Chairman's own committee has had more detailees from GAO than Republicans have had staff insofar as his information concerning my own request. Uh, me, my only me, request me, to the GAO concerning the independent that. counsel with, which you mentioned, and I think uh, I've got let, to address this me, for the record, me, if you'll let permit me, me to let me, let me give you an answer reclaim that, my time you had, before you, you respond, questions. Mr. Chairman. I do think but I have first of all, Mr. Chairman, first do I have the time? Well, let's, let's have order here. Uh, does the chairman wish to respond, or well, are you concluding? Well, I, I, I will just finish my sentence, and then I'd be delighted to listen to the chairman's response. As long as I get a little time here, that's fine. Mr. Chairman, we do have other members that have been waiting a long time. This has been a very interesting uh, exchange, but I really think we need to, uh, in, or in the hopes of moving this hearing along, I think we need to... But I just point out that the GAO is required uh, by statute, uh, to my knowledge, uh, to have audited the independent counsel. And I joined with other Republican members in writing the GAO to ask them to fulfill their statutory mandate 
to produce a report. I didn't personally and ask I, for that GAO that. report. So I, I think that. your information was in error. I applaud that. But let me, let me just observe. I've always told my Republican members in the House Administration's Committee that I've signed every letter that the Republicans have ever asked for detailees from GAO. I have also, I've also gotten them every nickel's worth of staff money they requested, if I could. And I've also supported them in getting every, every staff member that they wanted. The Republicans in our committee have control in entirety their own budget. I don't tell them what to do with a nickel of it. And if they want to have more staff, I support them in getting it. If they want to have more people on the payroll, I, I, I sign the vouchers and all the other things so that they get the people they want. If they want more detailees, I support them in that too. You haven't got a complaint on that in our committee. Now, maybe you've got a complaint somewhere else, but you don't have one on the Energy and Commerce Committee. That's an incredibly generous policy, Chairman Dingell. I'm I think delighted to hear that. I think my Republican colleagues need the staff to know what's going on, and then they will do a better job. <laughs> uh, we're, we're grateful for your testimony. It's been uh, complete and thorough, if not exhaustive, and uh, <laughs> I think we're, we're prepared to move on to Mr. Leach, who has been characteristically generous in, in waiting. Mr. Leach for his patience. Uh, the gentleman from Iowa is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Klinger and members of the committee, in, in the wake of uh, uh, Chairman Dingell's testimony, let me assure you that, that uh, the trough that I will attempt to plow will be uh, quite a bit narrower and, and substantially briefer. And, in fact, it will be extremely brief. I just want to make three very quick points. Uh, one in the abstract and in the very largest sense, what we're talking about with the GAO is our constitutional responsibilities. I think as this committee understands better than any other committee of Congress, uh, the Constitution posits a very precise oversight uh, accountability in the Congress, and what the GAO is all about is oversight. Uh, if we cripple the GAO, we cripple the oversight responsibility of the Congress of the United States. I have no idea what the appropriate funding level for the GAO should be, uh, but I'm very concerned that it, it not be uh, cut to the point that uh, our, the demands of con constitutional accountability will be put in, in, in a second level. Uh, in a narrow context, and the second point I'd like to make is that uh, as a member of the Banking Committee, uh, the work of the GAO has in brief been uh, exceptional. Uh, the GAO has been the closest to an honest assessor of the, G of the SNL industry in the, in the last decade. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in many areas, the GAO is the only credible uh, agency in Washington uh, giving advice on matters relating to SNL problems. Uh, in fact, and I, I would raise one minor, everyone knows, instance of uh, uh, policy changes the GAO has, has, has uh, uh, caused to occur. But one of the most interesting is in the area of certified public accounting, that is in the private sector. In the wake of the SNL scandal, uh, it was the GAO that set up new standards for generally accepted accounting practices uh, that have a great public uh, implication. Uh, but it was, in essence, cleaning up a private sector circumstance that has public policy uh, uh, spin-offs that the GAO led the way and for which I think the GAO ought to be given a great deal of credit. Uh, I'm very much aware, and I'll make this my last point, of the concerns that have been raised by members of the minority party, my party. Uh, these concerns tend to focus on GAO being too closely allied to the majority party in Congress. Uh, I personally think there is some basis uh, for that concern. Uh, but some of that concern also springs inevitably from the fact that the majority party and its chairman uh, play a larger role than my party does in crafting legislation. Uh, but I would say with regard to my committee of jurisdiction, uh, the GAO has been as cooperative with the minority as the majority. Uh, and not only do I have no complaints, I have a great deal of respect. Uh, finally, in this context, uh, in, in a broader perspective, uh, I would argue very strenuously uh, that at this particular time, the GAO is particularly important to the minority political party. Uh, and that is the case because uh, the majority party now is the party of the administration. And when there are miscues uh, of, of congressional policy or mistakes uh, of administration policy, uh, there are circumstances that develop that, quite frankly, the minority party cannot get congressional committee attention. 
uh, and the GAO provides an outlet uh, for investigation of that kind of miscue that is of not trivial proportion, uh, and that in this particular uh, political circumstance, I think the minority party has a, a disproportionate vested interest uh, in the GAO. In conclusion, I would just argue that if we fail to maintain a strong and viable GAO, the Congress will in effect give a permissive light to those who want to fudge the law or set aside ethics. The Constitution pointedly gives Congress programmatic oversight responsibilities that can't be shirked, and all of us have an enormous stake in a strong and viable GAO, but uniquely at this time, the minority party should have a disproportionate interest in seeing that the GAO is not weakened. And I thank you for your time, and I appreciate very much uh, your attention to this issue. Well, we appreciate your concern and testimony and your willingness to uh, join us for this length of time, Jim. This is uh, a very important hearing. Uh, this is an important agency, and the member's testimony is particularly critical uh, for the purpose that we come here this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm now pleased to recognize Robert Walker, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, who himself served with great distinction on government operations and with whom, uh, while he was a member of that committee, and even still now, we've enjoyed a very good relationship. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm delighted to be with you today and be back in this uh, committee room uh, where uh, we've had a number of interesting debates over the years, and uh, obviously this is going to be another one of those. Um, when I first came to Congress, one of the reasons why I asked to be on the Government Operations Committee was largely because uh, of uh, the work that uh, is done in oversight and investigations on this committee. And part of my uh, reason for doing so was also because of the work that I knew that went on with the GAO and the ability of this uh, committee to access uh, the GAO for a number of those investigations. At that time, I will tell you that I th think the GAO was one of the most respected institutions in Washington. They were respected largely because they were seen as nonpartisan, non-ideological, and uncompromised. Uh, my concern has been over the last several years that I think that some of that uh, has been uh, um, put uh, aside uh, and that, uh, that we have begun to see uh, reports uh, that do not reflect uh, the kind of uh, respect that they had before. And I will tell you that the, one of the reasons why I think that's the case is because they have become more and more a tool of the agenda of the Congress rather than a tool of, of, of investigation of the, of, of the overall uh, government. Let me give you a couple of things where I think that it is the case. I think instead of being nonpartisan, we have begun to see, at least from, uh, from the minority side, a tilt toward uh, the Democrats. That may be, in fact, be, uh, for the reasons that Chairman Dingle outlined here, that you all run the place and so therefore uh, are going to uh, uh, access uh, the tools uh, of the Congress, and particularly over the last 12 years when there has been an administration of the Republican Party. Uh, this was certainly uh, an ac access point for you to get the kind of uh, materials that you need. On the other hand, it seems to me that, the, that in the process, uh, the GAO has been hurt. Um, uh, I also believe that um, uh, instead of being non-ideological, that uh, an awful lot of GAO reports have begun now to tilt toward the ide ideological agenda of the requester. And I don't know that that's a, as much the fault of the GAO as it is the fact that what has happened here is that the people doing the requests ask the questions in a very specific way so that the outcome of the GAO report is, is largely um, one which was predestined based upon the questions that were asked. I mean, people have become very clever in the way that they have uh, formulated what it is they want back from the report because they know exactly how they want to use it in, in the end. But that also has, has undermined, it seems to me, the credibility of the GAO. And finally, uh, I believe that uh, the GAO has been compromised along the line because I think uh, that uh, they have begun to have a tilt toward whatever the, the political agenda is on Capitol Hill. And let me tell you that the one figure that I think is stunning in all of this, and that is when uh, back in 1980, 70% of all the GAO reports were self-initiated. Today, about that same number are initiated because uh, of what happened, because of requests out of the Congress. When they were doing self-initiated reports, they had a great deal of respect uh, for those reports because they were going after items that they believed were in the national interest to do. Now, uh, the, the question of interest is whatever Capitol Hill has as an interest or whatever Congress has an, as an interest, and that may not reflect necessarily where the national interest lies. Um, let me give you some, some uh, uh, statistics that, uh, and some um, uh, uh, questions that I have about GAO. First of all, I would agree with the uh, point made by uh, Mr. Cox uh, earlier about the numbers of requests. Uh, the figures I have here uh, differ a little bit, but it, but it gives you some idea of where we think the disproportionate uh, problem lies. 
In 1992, according to the figures I have, GAO received 1,772 requests which they completed for the Congress. Uh, this uh, is um, uh, 1,416 for Democrats, 356 were done for Republicans. Uh, that's almost a four to one ratio. Uh, that gives us some concern. When you look at the committee requests, it's the same thing. Even Mr. Bauscher has said that the actual ratio of Democrats versus Republican committee requests is eight or nine uh, out of ten. Uh, and uh, so um, it, it really is a, a, a pretty uh, substantial figure uh, of, of difference uh, between the two. Here's the problem that some of us have as, as Republicans. It is known that in some instances, Republicans can make a, a request on their own and expect it to be complied with. For instance, as ranking member of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, if I make a request in that area, it is likely to, to be followed through. And for, in fact, GAO is doing some very good work right now on the advanced technology program for me, and I'm very grateful for, for the cooperation I've had. The problem for the minority is that if you, in fact, you want to step outside that particular area and try to get a report done, you find that there's a great deal of resistance. And I'll give you one, one instance. It came out of work of this committee. As a member of this committee, I helped write. In fact, I'm considered the author of the Drug-Free Workplace Act. One of, the, one of the pieces of that bill was it required compliance by the Congress. We know that around the Congress there is a, a, a very, very large noncompliance with that. One of the things that I asked GAO to there do several... There is? Yes, there is, Mr. Chairman. Oh, uh, and in fact, the estimates are that 75 percent of the Congress is, uh, is not in compliance with the Drug-Free Workplace Act. Um, I asked GAO... You mean so the members or the staff? Uh, well, it, it's a little both. Both? Uh, yes. Oh, this um, is very and, interesting. And um, uh, uh, I asked GAO some years ago to, to investigate that. Uh, I wanted to get firm figures. I wanted to have uh, real figures from which to work. What I was told at that point was that I could not request that investigation. And I was, I was told in a letter from GAO that the leadership of the House would have to request such an investigation. Um, I asked whether or not Bob Michael, the minority leader, could request that investigation as a member of the leadership of the House. I was told no, Bob Michael couldn't request it. The only way that such a request could, could be done is if a Democrat signed on to it. So the only way that such an investigation could take place is if there was a bipartisan request in this particular instance because it, it was felt that this might end up reflecting poorly on the Congress. What I will say to you is I believe that that ends up being a non-request. Obviously, the Democratic leadership of the Congress did not want such a, uh, such a report done. Finding a Democrat to sign on to, to such a request was an impossibility, and so an impossible standard was set and no investigation was done. I would suggest that that is not an honest broker at that point. We are not getting then the kind of, uh, of response from GAO that would be expected if, if truly honest brokers were working in it. The other question that I have and the other problem that I have in the way that this works is the fact that the requester uh, of these reports can often hold them for their own purposes uh, and can uh, uh, control the access and the, uh, the release of those reports. What we have found happen on many cases is that those reports are done unknown to the minority side. In other words, Democratic chairmen request these on their own. They do not need bipartisan consent in order to get their reports done. The reports are held. Many times the minority is not even informed that the, re that the report was being done. We find out about it about 15 minutes before it is released at, at a meeting or at a press conference. It is done in a way to, to try to damage a, a point of view and, and uh, uh, ad advance another point of view. And we are in a position then of not debating the issue, but debating whether or not the, uh, the GAO uh, is, is right or wrong on these points. The GAO in that case has been used very, very um, uh, narrowly for a, the purpose of, of one person, often a committee chairman or a subcommittee chairman, who, who, is, who is advancing a particular agenda. I just think that that leads to uh, a, a lot of uh, partisan concerns about these reports. If you've had it done to you enough times, you come to the conclusion a at that point that GAO is in fact in cahoots with, with, with the chairman uh, and that, that, that you are being cut out of the process. Somewhere along the line, one of the reforms that needs to be done is that the minority and, 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 or everybody on a subcommittee ought to know about these reports being done. They ought not be sprung on you uh, uh, without uh, advance warning. Uh, on the question of detailees, I will say that I think there has been some improvement in that area. It, the improvement came after a good deal of intense pressure. Uh, the ability of uh, Charlie Rose and uh, Bill Thomas over at House Administration to sign off on these things at the present time has helped in that regard, and we've cut back from about 127 uh, detailees uh, last year to about 30 uh, right now. Uh, that's, a, that's a considerable change in, in, the, in the climate. 
uh, but um, uh, it is, um, uh, it is an, a system that in my view was abused um, in, in past years uh, and some of the corrections that have been done there are, are much welcomed. I hope we can correct some of these other problems so that we can take GAO back to being the kind of uh, respected institution bipartisanly as, as it was when I first arrived at this committee. Thank you, Mr. Walker. We'll uh, keep your uh, recommendations in mind because you've been on the committee and uh, you're still using them on another committee and I think your points are well taken. You may be surprised to know that there have been some modification of uh, some of the rules that will already accommodate uh, the points that you've made. Any, any questions or comments, Mr. Klinger? I would just like to thank uh, Mr. Walker uh, uh, for his uh, very good testimony. I think he's raised the, a lot of the issues that have been concerned on the Republican side of the aisle, and that's one of the reasons we're holding these hearings, is to try and address those and, uh, and make sure that the J.O. understands the, the nature of the concerns. And uh, you're, you have outlined it very thoroughly, and I think we'll get into that in more detail as we get to go through the hearing today. Mr. Cox? I'd like to uh, underscore the point that uh, Congressman Walker makes concerning the practice of requesting that the GAO embargo a report. Uh, this uh, has been something uh, by which I have been victimized as ranking member on the subcommittee uh, repeatedly. Uh, I've discussed it uh, with the Comptroller General, and I hope that we can uh, fix this problem. Uh, the information that has been provided to me as of October 25, 1993, is that during fiscal 1993, Democrat chairmen and members who requested that GAO embargo a report until they themselves released it, a total 339. Republicans who have asked that that be done, four. Uh, 339 to four. Uh, I'm sorry that any Republicans have requested that that be done, but uh, certainly this is a partisan phenomenon and it ought to be stopped. And I just well, thank you, gentlemen. I remember one instance, for instance, that came out of this committee. It was a subcommittee chairman on this committee that requested a report of an agent uh, about an agency that was going to be used in a very, very political way. The vote was due on the floor uh, in the next few days, and a press conference is going to be held using this report. The agency itself requested the opportunity to take a look at the report because they heard it was coming. They were told that it was totally embargoed, that not even the administrator of the agency could, could uh, look at the report, and no Republican was also permitted to look at the, at, the, at the report. I just think that that's an abuse of the process. I think that in that instance, the agency should have been at least uh, uh, been made aware of what was going to be in the report so that they could properly respond to it, uh, as it, as it turned out. Uh, some of the information as it was used by the, the, the person uh, ended up being misleading. Uh, and, um, uh, the, um, uh, and certainly at that point, uh, the Republicans uh, on, the, on the subcommittee should have been able to uh, be able to respond if indeed they wanted to do so. Uh, but um, I just think that that kind of use of the process is abusive. I'm sure you find as the ranking member on a subcommittee, or on a committee, excuse me, uh, that uh, when the GAO is doing work for your committee, it would be helpful. Uh, not in any way uh, an interference with uh, the uh, achievement of your objective if you could cooperate with the majority in both the request uh, and uh, in analyzing the report. I can't think of any reason, even if you didn't agree with the request and the Democrat had made it and had been honored, uh, that you couldn't be apprised of the fact and kept up to speed while the report was being developed. And I certainly can't think of any reason that it ought to be secret. There, I have read uh, very carefully uh, all of the uh, uh, statutory bases for the GAO's authority, and, and I don't see any requirement that when a member of Congress uh, acting alone or as chairman of a committee says, don't show this to members of the other party, uh, that the GAO should go along with it. This isn't fulfilling the national security. These aren't these kinds of secrets. They are only partisan secrets. I agree with the gentleman. In fact, the relationship that George Brown and I have had over to Science, Space, and Technology Committee has been one of cooperation on this, and I think it has added to the ability to ask the right questions if you really want a, a factual report if both the minority and the majority are cooperating in the request. It assures that both sides questions get asked. It assures then that the report is not skewed a particular way uh, in, its, in its final release, and I think you get a much better product out of that. So that is in fact the ideal, and I think that's what GAO would prefer to do, is to have bipartisan requests on most of these so that they can in fact go to both parties. But the, the, the abusive practice here has been that, uh, uh, that single parties have been able to request it. For the most part, those have tended to be Democrats. They have tended to be 
be committee chairmen, and they have tended to be people with an agenda. Uh, and uh, that has, in fact, I think undermined the, the, the credibility of the entire process. Uh, John Spratt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dennis Haster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the comments from the <coughs> gentleman from Pennsylvania and would comment that have you found in the reports many times, uh, even though when a GAO report comes up and tends to be uh, a non-biased report, that the editorial comment and even the title sometimes, the title is inflammatory, uh, completely uh, taken out of contest, and that's what ends up in the headlines. Well, I think that that's, that's the problem that you have if, if, G, if a GAO report becomes a part of, of what is essentially a political agenda. I mean, and also, also if people can cherry pick out of the report, if in fact they have controlled the report, the initial story on the report is going to be the only thing that people are, are, are going to focus on, the, pub, the public focus on. If what you do is show up at a press conference with a report that has a great title on it, uh, and then you cherry pick out of it a few items uh, that, that you release at a press release, and that becomes the story for the day, till everybody has a chance to read the report and, and we get to the secondary stories on it, if they're ever written. Uh, the, the, the fact is that uh, the report has been used uh, as, a, as a political document at that point, and, and the real factual nature uh, that may can be contained within it uh, has been lost in the public discussion. And you find, like myself, that many times that when we talk about partisan and the gentleman from Michigan and the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Commission talking about partisan, some of this isn't partisan at all. It's just an agenda that's out there sure. that somebody wants to push. Sure. And, and, and that's right. I mean, in many cases, it, it, it's an ideological agenda rather than a political agenda, or, or it just it may be a personal agenda. I mean, we've had people around here who pursued, pursued personal agendas and used uh, the GAO as, as the backup for a personal agenda. And thank you, gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Uh, Mrs. Thurman. Well, I don't pretend to know about all the GAO reports that have happened out here. But I, but I will agree with you on one thing, and, and my experience has been that whenever I'm independently or as a personal kind of thing when you go in and ask the questions, I couldn't agree with you more. I don't know how you fix that. And I certainly think that uh, the opportunity ought to be given to GAO that they can do things more on their own or more on a scheduled basis and certainly in, in conjunction with um, looking at the performance auditing too. Because I think we do get a very skewed view of what happens in government, not because of them, but because they've been asked to do it a certain way. They've been given the right questions, and they know. And, and quite honestly, I think that may be some part of the title issue as well. Um, and, and, and I'd be interested, too. It's my understanding that all these reports have to be um, made public within 30 days. So there is that opportunity. I mean, I don't know how you stop agencies or people, because I'm sure that we both would agree, at least from what I've seen over the years, that both sides would use that to whatever advantage there was. So, and I think there's probably abuses on both sides of that. And maybe that's an issue that we ought to look at, that until, you know, whether it's the committee or the person or whatever, but that you would have that time to review it, but that there would be a, a where nobody could report it or let it out into the public until after that 30-day review, so everybody had that opportunity. Well, that, that, that might be a correction. Let me, let me just make a couple of points about what you say. Um, uh, I would be far more comfortable if the ratio of the reports uh, being done by the GAO were self-initiated reports going back to, to kind of the old standard. I mean, I, I would much rather see them doing, doing things uh, that were self-initiated rather than congressionally initiated. Uh, I would also t uh, tell you that I think that the way in which you assure that uh, the right questions get asked is to have uh, at least some bipartisan cooperation or at least a couple of members signing on to these so that there are several questions being asked and it's not just, it's just, just one, one agenda. As I say, we have found at the Science, Space and Technology Committee that that's certainly the case. Where George Brown and I are both cooperating on getting the questions asked, uh, we tend to uh, maybe not want the same questions asked, but, to, but the combination of the two uh, makes certain that you get a far more balanced report. Um, finally, the 30-day rule is, is in fact right. I mean, these reports do come, become public, but if you never knew the report was being done, the chances of your finding it, uh, at, you know, 30 days later when nobody has paid any attention to it, it didn't come out the way somebody wanted it, and so therefore they, they, they basically buried it and didn't do anything more with it, the chance of your finding that in the, in the busyness of everything else you do uh, around here is, is not real good. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, you know, if you have somebody who likes what they got and is trumpeting it through a press release or a press conference or something like that, those are the GAO, GAO reports that become known. You may suggest a, a, a rather good solution here, and that is to put the 30 days up front uh, to say that uh, there's, there's a 30-day review process where the report would go to the entire committee or to the entire subcommittee before it is to be released for their review prior to the press conference being held uh, so that, um, uh, so that th there is a, uh, there's an opportunity here uh, for uh, people to have uh, some chance to review it. It may not even have to be 30 days. If you, if you gave even 15 days for people to review the material before somebody goes out and, and trumpets a, uh, at a press conference, that, that would certainly be, be a help. And that probably should particularly be done where there has been no more than one person requesting the report. Uh, the, if, it's, if it's a committee-based report, the fact is you do get them up front, uh, you know, where, uh, and, but, but it, w w probably what we need is a standard to assure that where, where one person has requested a report, uh, that p uh, a variety of people have a chance to reflect on it before it uh, is made public. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Craig Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Walker, are you familiar with the um, Oversight Board of the Office of Technological Assessment? Just generally, uh, yeah. I, I'm just wondering if you if you think there would be merit in having some kind of a bipartisan review. Uh, number one, to deal with the numbers. Number two, to deal with the topics and the subjects, so that there was some sort of a process in which uh, these studies would be reviewed, where you would kind of peer review them uh, before before they exactly. were actually undertaken. Where exactly. where to in, in, instead of GAO finding itself in a position of being pressured, there, there would be a, kind of another appeals board. Exactly. For example, uh, public lands, which I happen to be familiar, I think, and I, I think the number's around 17 of these similar reports that were, that were made, and they were designed to continue an, an issue. I just wondered if you think that might be Well, uh, uh, I would be interested in to, to know I, uh, what GAO would, would think about that, whether or not this adds a, a tier of, of people. They don't think much of it, as a matter of fact. I have a <laughs> bill, and... Uh, which does a number of things. It encourages the private, uh, I mean, the um, initiative of their own. But obviously, they don't want to be encumbered by any anything. And uh, sure. I, I don't agree with that. But it's all well, right. Well, I, I understand. But but my the only reason why I raise the caution is, uh, you know, I don't. I'm not certain that you want it, uh, a uh, a bipartisan panel that sorts out uh, in uh, things that really do need to be done. Uh, but um, uh, uh, reflect upon the establishment. I mean, those those pi those panels sometimes become establishment-oriented groups uh, as well. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I don't want to block something from getting done that absolutely Understand. needs to be done. But you can't have it both ways. You no, have I have to have some sort of a system, or else you got what you got. And, no, I, uh, no, I agree. And but but I go back to the point that I would be far more comfortable if GAO was making some of those decisions internally, and then suffering suffering the, the, the consequences of the, of the criticism of, of some of the priorities that they picked. I mean, th th that's not going to insulate them from from criticism because the priorities that they're picking then uh, would be subjected to criticism. But at least at, at that at they would they would be doing the job of, uh, of an honest broker, uh, and uh, my guess is that, the, that in the course of a year they would not do, or the course of a couple of years they would not do 17 studies on public lands uh, if, if they're doing. They might do one because it's, a, it's an important study, but my guess is they wouldn't be doing 17 separate reports uh, if, if they were self-initiating. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bill Zeleth, the gentleman from New Hampshire. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Micah, the gentleman from Florida. Uh, Mr. Walker, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If, uh, if I might divert from some of the line that you've uh, gotten into this, the spin that's put on some of these reports, et cetera, uh, to ask a question about uh, oversight of these overseers. I, I respect your judgment. You're sort of known as the pit bull uh, on the floor of the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, looking out for right uh, That's truth, one of the better things I've known as. Truth, <laughs> justice, and, <laughs> and uh, the American way. But I, I have uh, before me a report on the cost of uh, uh, Mr. Browser's, the uh, uh, head of uh, GAO, uh, the Comptroller General of the United States, his driver. And this reveals about $25,000 in overtime, $60,000 uh, is his salary, $60,585, in fact. Uh, it's, you know, maybe, maybe this gentleman 
earn that money. But my question is, uh, what is your recommendation as sort of the congressional pit bull to oversee uh, the overseers with uh, these kinds of uh, activities? Well, I would suggest you have some very good questions to ask to Mr. Browser here in a, in a, in a, in a couple of moments. Uh, uh, specific? Uh, well, I mean, obvi obviously, you know, as a, as a congressional agency, uh, uh, they are they are subject to the same kind of. Uh, uh, of oversight that uh, the, the, the leadership is here uh, and, you know, leadership uh, uh, perks and privileges uh, to constantly come under review and uh, th this is the appropriate committee. I mean, uh, you know, I, I congratulate Chairman Conyers for, for giving you the opportunity to have this kind of, uh, kind of hearing because uh, having uh, been on this committee for a number of terms uh, here, I think this is the appropriate committee to be, to be uh, uh, doing this kind of work uh, and to be looking into uh, this uh, particular um, a matter because this is the committee ultimately that that I think uh, bears the greatest responsibility for making certain the GAO has has credibility. Well, one of the problems I have, uh, and I won't belabor this point, is I started out here uh, some months ago uh, mentioning that we had that the, the majority party. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. When we started out, had 55 investigative staff. The minority party had uh, five investigative staff. Now, you know, when, when the Republicans, uh, the other party, controlled the, uh, uh, the White House, uh, uh, it was one situation. Now you have them controlling the Congress, both houses, the House, the Senate, uh, and also uh, the executive branch. Um, I'm just wondering if we have the tools as, as a minority to also police uh, the majority and these types of activities. Well, I, was I just learned of this today. Yeah, I was fascinated here a few minutes ago when uh, Mr. English was talking about the need for some balance. Uh, he was talking about the fact that uh, when, the, when the administration was in, uh, when we had the Reagan and Bush administrations in, you had all of these people down in the administration that uh, were on Capitol Hill, and we needed to have the resources up here in order to face off against the administration. Well, what about the, the present situation where all the resources of the administration, all the resources of the Congress are concentrated in one party, and, and, and the minority party is still left without uh, the resources uh, to, uh, to challenge uh, some of those kinds of concerns? I think that is a very uh, legitimate concern, uh, uh, and the, it's a legitimate concern for the American people because, in my view, some of the uh, investigations of this administration and some of the uh, uh, corrupt practices uh, that are alleged in this administration are not getting the kind of airing on Capitol Hill that, uh, that uh, should be uh, happening. And they are the kinds of things that would be aired uh, pretty uh, roundly on Capitol Hill if uh, th this administration was, was controlled by an opposition party. I appreciate your comments, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, as you depart, I... Uh, must observe that I uh, envy the position that uh, Chairman Brown is in because had you stayed on this committee, then I would enjoy your services as the ranking member. Well, uh, my colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Klinger, uh, uh, is, uh, is a capable uh, uh, ranking member. I'm sure that uh, it's enjoyable to work with him. Uh, I enjoyed working with you over the years. We had our share of battles, but they were always good-natured, and I, I enjoyed being on this committee. And I can't help but observe that I've had the feeling the whole time I'm sitting here that Chairman Brooks is star staring right directly at me. <laughs> well, he is. That's, that's why that picture is hanging there. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Jim Lightfoot, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify before uh, the Committee on Operations of the General Accounting Office. Uh, I'm interested in sharing with you some of my experiences with the GAO during a recent investigation and a report that the agency completed for me. Uh, also a former member of uh, this committee and uh, our former colleague, Teddy Weiss, who has served as uh, his opposite. And, uh, I appreciate the, the good work this committee does. You served with great distinction, and we're glad to know that your concerns still bring you into the Government Operations Committee room. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On April of this year, I wrote to the Comptroller General requesting the GAO initiate an investigation into payroll and personnel actions taken by the White House since Inauguration Day. Uh, this was stimulated by reports coming to us from career uh, federal employees who were feeling very uncomfortable with a number of the things they were being asked to do. GAO's report on the investigation released to the public on September the 9th of this year. Among the issues uh, I would like to discuss with you today is a variation in content of the different parts of this report. GAO's policy in providing copies of draft reports to the requestors, 
the terminology that's used by GAO in its reports, and the GAO's objectivity and susceptibility of GAO to influence in its conclusions by congressional or executive branch leadership. First of all, I do not mean to be overly critical of GAO's investigative reports. In fact, uh, we were very pleased with GAO's cooperation in initiating the request, and I believe that GAO has limits in what it can investigate based on the information that it has provided. But having said that, let me start with the concern I have about the GAO's policy in releasing drafts of their reports. Let me tell you what happened in our case. I learned that a so-called discussion draft of the reporter requested was released to a reporter eight days before I had any knowledge that such a discussion draft even existed. This so-called discussion draft was given to the White House, the party that was being investigated, eight days before I, who had asked for the investigation, was given a copy. The same day it was given to the White House, a reporter who also was given a copy of it. And you can understand we were a little bit surprised when uh, we received a phone call from a reporter to the office asking us to comment uh, on this uh, draft discussion uh, when he, his quote was, I've had a copy of the report for eight days and today I'm running a story on it. Well, it's pretty hard to comment on something that you haven't seen, plus the fact uh, it makes us wonder why it was released to the White House and why it was released to the press. My staff person called the GAO to request a copy of the leaked discussion draft. At that point, she was denied a copy of that draft. They stated at the GAO it was not their policy to release such discussion drafts. And the only way that we could get our hands on a copy of it was for me to make a personal call to the GAO and demand a copy of the draft. And they were reluctant at first to even give it to me. And it seemed strange to me when GAO stated it's their policy to prohibit anyone from releasing a copy of uh, a discussion draft. But once it's been leaked, how in the world can they continue to prohibit its release, particularly to the person that requested investigation in the first place? And you were the requester in this instance? Correct. In addition, we were disturbed to learn that while the subject of the investigation, in this case the White House, was allowed the opportunity to comment on and influence the final report, the requestor is not allowed this opportunity. The question then is why should GAO allow the subject of his investigations to influence the outcome of their findings? Now the fact the discussion draft on my request report was leaked gives us a perfect example of why this is a major problem. And here's a quote from this discussion draft that we were not allowed to see until after we had found out about it from the press. In quotes, we do not think the president or his designee was given unfettered discretion to make retroactive payments of salary as a purely discretionary matter and without a rational basis. We do not believe the president was given unfettered authority to make retroactive pay adjustments without any limitation." End of quote. When the final draft came through and the final report came through, those statements just disappeared into thin air. And the statement that replaced it was simply this. We concluded the retroactive pay increases were proper, end of quote. I think that's two different messages. Uh, does this mean that the GAO changed their mind between the time the discretion draft was written and the time the final draft was written? Or were they unduly influenced by uh, the White House's comments uh, on the study? Those are questions that I think should be answered. And even if GAO ultimately determined there was nothing illegal about backdated appointments and pay raises, the use of the word proper leads me to believe, Mr. Chairman, the GAO actually condones this activity. I ask my colleagues to consider whether we really should condone or encourage the White House, or anyone else for that matter, to backdate appointments and pay raises as much as three months when the Comptroller General has previously ruled that such actions are specifically prohibited for all federal employees. That's all of us. I really believe GAO's choice of terminology in their reports needs to be reevaluated. I think you'll be interested to know that I did, in fact, communicate my objections to the use of the term proper by GAO in the draft report in association with these questionable practices, but those objections obviously were ignored from reading the final report. And finally, Mr. Chairman, one last frustration I had in my experience with GAO involved the data they were able to consider in their investigation. And I realize that GAO is, is limited in its investigative ability with the data that it has access to. But I also believe the GAO could have been a little more persistent in searching for documentation. 
They simply relied on documentation that the White House chose to provide them and accepted the statements of White House officials as fact because they had no other information to rely on. And I think, quite frankly, the lack of documentation should have influenced their conclusions a bit more than they did. I was also quite disappointed that GAO accepted, and here we go again, that word retroactive, but retroactively completed paperwork as documentation. In other words, there were no documents existing to back up the retroactive payroll actions. There was nothing there to prove the people had actually been at work when they had. So what the GAO did, they allowed the White House uh, to fill out paperwork, undated memos with no dates on them, and then they accepted that as justification for uh, the backdated action. It's kind of nice if you can go in and rewrite the evidence after the crime, I guess. Furthermore, I was very disappointed that uh, I was declined uh, by the GAO on a suggestion that uh, they interview former White House employees to gain some historical perspective on the practices that they were investigating. We thought that was important to what they were doing to find out what has happened in previous administrations, Republican and Democrat alike. Uh, they declined to do that, which leads me to feel that it's impossible for them to determine or even attempt to determine whether such practices have been commonplace uh, in past administrations. And one more inconsistency that we found. GAO basically made no comment on the White House's lack of documentation even for these backdated actions. I think this is very unusual, highly unusual for GAO. For example, in their investigation of the Bush administration use of detailees, the GAO strongly chastised the White House's lack of documentation backing up their actions. And these were for people that weren't even on the White House payroll. And I would hope that someone could explain uh, that discrepancy to me, why that was not mentioned in this particular case. Again, Mr. Chairman, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share with you some of my observations and experiences this morning. Uh, helpful to your oversight, and we look forward to any questions you might have. Well, I want to express my uh, gratitude to the gentleman from Iowa for coming before us today. Uh, you, you've been very helpful, and uh, if you have any time, uh, uh, General Bowser will be here uh, to make explanations to you uh, on the record or separately uh, as you choose, as your schedule permits. But be, we again it. welcome seeing you in the committee room. We miss your services, but I know you're working with government operations and uh, you're following uh, GAO pretty carefully. Outside of that event, would you give them a, a B, or C for their overall work outside of the instance that you've uh, brought to our attention? One of the things, well, let me put it this way. We'll give them two or three grades. Okay. Probably an A or a B for effort, because I think their people uh, tried to do what they could do under the restraints that they operate under. Uh, I would give the final product probably a D, because of some of the things we That's mentioned here. Passing. That uh, when I mean, if I'm going to, if, if John Conyers is sent to investigate me and all you can do is say, Mr. Lightfoot, I understand you've done something wrong, uh, what's your feeling? And I say, well, Mr. Conyers, I haven't done anything wrong. And you say, well, Mr. Lightfoot, do you have any documentation to back that up? And I say, no, but I'll fix a memo for you. And I prepare the memo and give it to you. And then Mr. Conyers files a report, no, Mr. Lightfoot hasn't done anything wrong. Uh, somehow that doesn't, doesn't seem to wash very well. But, Jim, I, I wanted to take out the uh, example that you cited that they did. I, I'll assume you're correct and they failed that. But if we took that out, could they go from a D to a C, maybe? Other than that, <laughs> We're going to rewrite the report card. Uh, you're talking about an, an overall. O overall, yes. In other instances that we've dealt with the GAO, uh, I would say that well, maybe a C, grudging C minus. C minus. Okay. <laughs> okay. Look, it's your call. I mean, uh, what, we'll keep him off the honor roll, but we'll keep him in school. How's All that? All right. That's that's fair enough. And I, I think uh, we've got a, a row full of them, and they're taking prodigious notes. So I, I doubt if this is going to happen again. But if it does, we we will be oversighting it, and we'll be holding hearings. Well, Mr. Uh, to Chairman, make I'd, sure it doesn't happen again. I would like to to, to add to. It. And, and you brought up a very important point here. Uh, 
In no way what I'm saying do I mean this to malign any individual or anyone that's within GAO. The folks that we worked with were good people. They worked hard. But if you've got a structure that doesn't allow them to function as they should, then that structure needs to be, to be investigated or rethought or changed in some manner and form to allow them to do what their mission is, which is basically nonpartisan, unbiased investigations into governmental agencies. And we need that oversight. We obviously do. It doesn't make any difference who's in the White House. That's, I that's couldn't immaterial. agree with you more. Any comments or questions? I just ask uh, uh, Congressman Lightfoot whether uh, you have learned from the GAO uh, how it was that the report, which you did not see uh, in timely fashion uh, relative to the press, was uh, in fact provided to the press. We still don't know. It, it went to a reporter in, uh, I believe it was in Atlanta, was where it surfaced first. And then, of course, the White House had been given a copy of it. So, you know, you could, you could deduce that, that uh, there's two possible sources of, of leakage at that point. Did someone in GAO leak it? I kind of doubt that. Uh, did someone in the White House leak it? They were the only ones that had the copy. I think they're appropriately suspect under the circumstances. So, you know. I used to be a cop, so I got a suspicious mind. I don't trust anybody. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But, uh, yeah, I think that, that you could take this argument another direction. Had that draft not been leaked, we would never have known that that draft existed and that it was somewhat critical of practices within the White House because all we would have seen would have been the final report. So in this case, the leaky, whoever that might be, probably did us a service in allowing us the opportunity to see that there is a difference between the draft discussion and what the final report was in almost 180 degree flip in, in opinion. There was another issue that uh, was uncovered, and this might be something, Mr. Chairman, that, that you'd want to look at as well. Uh, while GAO was going after the information pertaining to the backdating issue, they found, uh, I believe it was 25 people who had been being paid both out of the uh, transition account and out of the White House payroll account, which I'm not an attorney, but folks around here tell me that's illegal. Uh, due to the fact that we had not specifically asked GAO to investigate that particular issue, they didn't. And they were well within their rights. I'm not saying they did anything that they shouldn't have done. But perhaps in, in your committee's oversight, there needs to be something in there that if during the course of an investigation something else is in uncovered that is questionable in nature, that there ought to be an automatic pursuit <coughs> to the end of that to, to see where it is. Because, That's a possibility. Now, uh, was this person you referred to as the leaky, should he have been called the leaker? Well, it depends on the gender, I guess. I'm not sure. The gender. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Jim. You, you've added a great deal to our discussion. And uh, we're glad always to see you and, and know that you're working with the committee and, and trying to help GAO improve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate the good work you're doing. We're now delighted to call uh, General Charles A. Bowser. Uh, who has two options right now. Uh, one is he can present his statement, or two, he can answer to 957 different charges that have been laid before him uh, since uh, 11 o'clock this morning. Uh, welcome, Mr. Sokolar. Uh, your testimony will be put in the record, and you may proceed in your own way. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I would like to uh, summarize my statement here and maybe get some uh, things cleared up a bit. Um, first, uh, GAO is about the same size it has been for the last 20 years. There was um, a slight uh, increase in the number of our professionals uh, back in the early part of the 70s uh, when an, another group was transferred from the GAO to the uh, GSA, but by and large, there's not been any uh, increase in the last 20 years at GAO, and certainly no increase in staff during my 12 years as Controller General. 
we've been right around 5,100 uh, size. Uh, since the freeze has been put on two years ago because of budget reductions, we are now down to 4,900. And with the early out that has been approved by the con Congress, which I agreed with, why we think we will be down to about 4,600 here uh, at the end of this fiscal year. And that would put us down uh, close to the 10 or 12 percent uh, goal that uh, has been announced over in the executive branch. And I think we probably got there. Uh, quicker than most uh, government agencies. Uh, if I could compare that, uh, uh, Congressman Cox raised the thing about Price Waterhouse. Uh, let me just point out that I was a partner of Arthur Anderson and Company, one of the big firms. And in the mid 60s, why um, uh, we were an organization of about 5,000. Arthur Anderson today is an organization of 60,000, 10 times the size. Uh, GAO was also an organization of 5,000 in the mid-60s, and we're still an organization of 5,000. So this idea that GAO is growing tremendously is, um, is not factual, except in the dollars. In other words, in the dollar increase, why uh, uh, we've gone up, but that's basically because of pay increases. And then uh, for two other reasons, we've uh, had to computerize GAO, as every organization like this has had to do. And uh, we have been also redoing our building, which unfortunately had asbestos put in in the early 1950s. And so the cost of removing the asbestos, moving our people out into lease space for a period of years, and bringing them back has been expensive. And so that's why our dollar uh, increase is, uh, is going up. Uh, but uh, the size of GAOs, I would like to just stress one more time. Uh, even compared to Price Waterhouse. When I look at some of their numbers that was in a recent uh, document, uh, they look like they have close to 9,000 uh, people and a budget or a total revenues uh, triple R's. So I think GAO is, is um, trying to audit a government that is a trillion six uh, in total budget, much more complicated than it was 10 or 20 years ago, and actually uh, 10 times the size of the budget. If you go back, 20 years, why you'll see that the budget was um, somewhere between 100 and 200 uh, uh, million dollars. So, uh, so this is a um, uh, organization that has had to become more productive, and that's exactly what we've done. If you look on page four of my testimony, you will see that there are certain statistics there since the last time we were uh, had an oversight hearing in 1985, and you'll see that the amount of uh, reports that we have been issued to the Congress, the number of testimonies we've done and the number of completed congressionals are up all over 100 percent. And it's only been accomplished by us becoming more efficient, more effective, ut utilizing the computers that are available today. But really, it's a tribute to the GAO people uh, for their ability to um, improve and, uh, and do an awful lot of work. On page five or six of my testimony, I lay out some of the financial um, uh, achievements that uh, has been uh, accomplished only because of legislative and executive actions. In other words, as I say here, often our work contributes to legislative and executive actions that result in very significant financial benefits to the American taxpayer. These benefits include budget reductions, cost avoided, appropriation deferrals, and revenue enhancements that we can document as either directly attributed to or significantly influenced by our work. Uh, I um, will not go through the list here uh, because uh, some of the other witnesses have, um, and some of the members of the committee on both sides of the aisle have uh, uh, used many of the illustrations. I would just use one, though, that I think show, it shows the indication. When I first came into office in the early 1980s, one of the big projects that the government had going was the Breeder Reactor Program, which was a multi-billion dollar program down in Tennessee. And another uh, big effort was out in Ohio, which was an enriched uranium uh, plant, uh, which was to uh, do uh, second te uh, generation technology for producing the enriched fuel that we needed to uh, run our power nuclear power plants. Uh, now, when the Congress had been uh, uh, advised to go forward with both of these uh, uh, programs, the, uh, the idea was that the uh, United States would have to provide enriched uranium for 2,000 nuclear power plants, both here in this country and in the, and the rest of the world. But of course, by 1981, when I came into office, why that figure was down to maybe around 150 from 2,000. 
And so the question was, with the uh, uh, facilities at Oak Ridge operating at 40 percent of their capacity, uh, did we need these new programs? GAO was asked to, to do, make the reviews. We did. Uh, the votes uh, were very close in the Senate and the House. Uh, both uh, projects were continued uh, by very close votes. Uh, we were asked to do more studies. Uh, eventually, the uh, Congress voted down the breeder program. And, uh, and uh, I believe that saved the taxpayer many billions of dollars. And then eventually the Secretary of Energy, a couple of years later, uh, uh, stopped the program in, uh, for, uh, in Ohio for that uh, enriched uranium because there was a third technology effort going out there in one of the big labs in, in California. I use this as an illustration to point out that it does take uh, action by either the legislative uh, body uh, which was the case of the breeder reactor, or the executive branch, such as the plant in Ohio, to, to move GAO's recommendations and reports into a policy decision-making uh, situation. And, uh, and that's what we work on all the time, and lots of times it does take more than one report. Uh, uh, last year, the Senate uh, voted to, or the Congress voted to um, reduce uh, the, some of the defense inventory by uh, close to $4 billion. Uh, they did that after many uh, different reports by GAO. Uh, and, and so uh, sometimes one report doesn't do it and others have to be uh, done. Uh, I would like just to point out a couple more uh, issues where we work uh, a great deal on, uh, Mr. Chairman. We've done some management reviews in recent years at G by GAO. And I think the uh, leaders in the executive branch have found those to be very useful. Uh, first one we did was on, on HUD, and of course we pointed out at that time that the, uh, the financial reports could not be made because of the bad financial uh, uh, records. Uh, later on, uh, uh, Congressman Lantos of this committee held the hearings that pointed out all the problems. But I think it was, shows clearly what I think is one of the great problems of the federal government today, and one that I have advocated uh, corrective action ever since I've been in office and even before I came into office, and that is that we've got to get the financial management systems of this government in much better shape. I congratulate this committee for the CFO Act of a couple of years ago. I hope that we can extend that. I understand the administration is going to propose audits of all the large uh, uh, agencies of the federal government and a modernization of the financial systems. I strongly recommend that, and I think that would help with the uh, cutting down on the fraud, waste, and abuse in this uh, federal government and would lead to much better managed programs than what we've had in the past. Uh, we uh, have uh, done other management reviews, like at the IRS, where the commissioner re recently said that the uh, corrective programs that they have been able to start all started with the GAO management review. Secretary Brock was very um, complimentary in the management review. We were able to give him when he was the Secretary of Labor, and he worked from uh, that um, review to his agenda for improving the Department of Labor. And recently, we completed one in agriculture, which uh, S Secretary Madigan uh, announced his program to reduce some of the field organization. Secretary Espy has uh, continued to uh, work on that problem. And the NPR, of course, the um, report that Vice President Gore has recently released uh, also indicates that they are going to uh, work on that. So I think the GEO work is very useful and it's done very well by some very dedicated people. Now we have also improved our operational improvements in, in recent years. We have uh, redone our format so that the, uh, the reports are better, uh, are, are more readable, are better illustrated, and, uh, and, and have been used uh, by a great many people beyond the Congress even and the executive branch. We have a great deal of demand for these GAO reports. We uh, do our work in 35 issue areas, uh, and we have tied our regional core groups recently into that so that we're working more in a teamwork effort uh, and to improve our process. And of course, one of the big areas is how do you use modern technology? And that's costly, but it also gives you the productivity, as I see, that, as I sh uh, indicate here, that GAO has been able to um, achieve. Now, there have been recent concerns, and some of these have been uh, set forth here today, and I'd like to address some of those concerns. One is that the minority party, the Republicans, have uh, 
uh, been critical of too many detailees uh, coming over here and working with them. The detailees have on many occasions that done just what Chairman Dingo outlined, and that is help save a lot of taxpayer money on some of these tough issues. Uh, the um, uh, detailees, though, have been reduced. In other words, we're down to about 30 uh, detailees uh, from a high of around 60 or 70 that we were running a couple of years ago, just because I did want to be responsive to the concerns of the minority party that maybe too many uh, uh, GAO people were over here uh, on, on the staff. And we're trying to uh, keep good control over that operation. But I do want to point out that many times the detailees have been very successful in uh, 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 helping the, the various committees in the Congress. Uh, as far as access to GAO, the ranking minority people can request GAO reports just like the chairman of the committees. And we would be more than pleased to have more requests from the, from the uh, minority party. And we'd be very pleased to have more bipartisan requests. There in no way are we trying to work exclusively for one party or, or the party that's in power. We want to work for both. I might point out that when the Republicans controlled the Senate in the early part of the 1980s for six years, why the request ratio was 50 percent of the uh, work that we were doing at that time was requested by the Republican uh, chairman, only 30 percent by the Democratic minority and about 20 percent was uh, self-initiated. So there's been a history here that when the party, uh, uh, the Republican Party is, has uh, control of one of the houses, why we do work for them just as we do, of course, with the Democrats. The agency comments is a, is a problem, but one of the problems is the additional time it takes and the leaks, as um, Mr. Lightfoot pointed out. Uh, um, people would like to have more time to uh, work with us on those agency comments, but we do have sometimes lose control when somebody leaks a report, and that's just most unfortunate. But it happens, it happens fairly frequently, and I regret that very much. Uh, it is one of the real procedural problems we have in doing our work, and that is when we try to share the report with the agency, get their comments and everything like that, that sometimes people there or somewhere else, not in GAO, but somewhere else, uh, decides that they maybe can get a good spin on that report and uh, they leak it and uh, Congressman Lightfoot uh, illustrated a problem. Uh, on the embargo on the, for the 30 days, why uh, that is to allow the committees to uh, help um, uh, set up their testimonies and understand what's in the report. Lots of times the embargo does not last 30 days because as soon as it is released, we then release the report to the public. Uh, again, uh, we feel that most of the committees, most of the subcommittees uh, work well with this procedure, but occasionally there is disagreement among the chairman and the ranking minority, and the working relationship is not as good as it should be, and there are trouble. But not a lot, not a high percent of the time, but it is a, is a continuing problem for us. Uh, we list all the GEO reports today in a job start monthly report that comes over here. And uh, we uh, make sure that uh, all our reports become public to the American taxpayer, to the American press, unless they are classified by the Department of Defense or the Department of State. Let me just say a few words about the GAO of the future. One is, as I've mentioned already, that we are downsizing. We'll be down to about 10 or 12 percent smaller than what we are were last year. We are. Uh, uh, closing some of our field offices that uh, will, will be announced here uh, soon because uh, we have to do that to get to the uh, smaller size. And also our Appropriations Committee in the Senate has asked us to do that. We're also looking at our overhead. Uh, so we are uh, working hard to make sure that GAO is as efficient as possible and as effective as possible as an organization. Uh, we uh, need to do um, uh, a lot of work, I think, in the future here on uh, health care. Once the uh, Congress passes a health care program, I'm sure that we're going to be asked to evaluate how well is the program working on many different issues. We're going to be looking at uh, the downsize in the Department of Defense, the base closures, the number and different weapons that will be approved, the logistics. A big area is the Department of Energy when we're looking at the nuclear weapon plants, which has a great deal of problems in those nuclear weapon plants, both in safety and in uh, environmental. And uh, I'm sure we will be asked to work uh, 
uh, with the Congress and look at how well some of the reinventing of the government is taking place as some of the major agencies like the IRS, the Social Security Administration, the, Agri the Agriculture Department and that uh, uh, try to uh, improve their operations and try to uh, uh, become a smaller and more effective government. Let me just say a few words about the GAO people. GAO attracts and recruits and retains some of the finest people in government. When I complete my term here in 1996, I will have spent 20 years in the private sector and 20 years in the public sector. I served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy for four years, uh, to over 15 years ago. And uh, I can tell you that the GAO people are among the finest people that I have ever worked with. We have really great talent. We, we had 5,000 people looking for our 250 openings uh, before we had to go on a freeze. So we are one agency that has no trouble attracting first class people. We also have a, a very big effort to make sure that we have a strong affirmative action program. And if you look on page 13 of my statement, you will see that we have ach achieved some really fine results in that area. I was pleased, therefore, that the Congress uh, was able to give us the early out authority because as we had to downsize, it was much better to uh, downsize uh, letting some of our more senior people voluntarily uh, go out early uh, rather than to force out some of the fine young uh, people that we've been able to hire in the last 10 years and we certainly uh, will be able to maintain our diverse program here, our, our program of diversity. Our training program is among the best in government. If, we, if, we, uh, uh, if the committee would have time to look at our training manual, I think compared to any other government agency, and we insist on a continuing education program of our people of 80 hours over two years and, uh, and the uh, continuing updating of the capability. We also reward the people who excel at GEO. We have gone to a pay for performance system. We do not use the old established uh, government pay system where everybody got a pay increase every year by just staying another year. We are actually rewarding our people according to their performance. This has ca caused some concerns among some of our people and we are modifying that system. But we also are promoting our people by merit. So this is an organization that has worked very hard to make sure that the best people are rewarded and the best people are promoted. Now, we know we have some problems. Uh, and uh, 1990, I asked Dr. Deming to come and uh, uh, be at GAO one, one day. He said he'd be happy to come. If, he could, if we'd meet on Saturday, he'd come and not charge us his usual $10,000 fee. We took him up on his offer. And we have now been in a TQM program to improve the quality, to improve our processes, to integrate our technology, and to get our people working more as a team for three years. And I think it will take another three years because both he and Dr. De uh, Dr. Duran e estimate that it takes about six years to make great improvements in, a, in an organization in the private sector. They've said 10 years in the uh, government. Uh, if it's 10 years, I will be gone by four years. So I'm working hard to see if I can't get, get GAO to be as um, uh, timely on that uh, as the private sector and do it in six years. Uh, so anyway, we're working very hard here now on improving our processes so we can get to the one issue that's plagued GAO for many, many years, and that is how long it takes us to do the work. I might also point out that we have very stringent quality review processes. Uh, we uh, are um, uh, constantly uh, uh, looking at how to improve that, we, uh, we have long had an uh, independent quality review of all reports going out from each of our agency. We have senior leadership that review all our reports. We have an annual post-assignment quality review system, which I brought the idea from Arthur Anderson that we should check ourselves out every year. And we have an outside quality review group headed up by Elliot Richardson and staffed by people like Sandy Burton, the former chief accountant of the SEC, David Linnos, a distinguished uh, professor from the University of Illinois, John Ryan Landler, and we intend to add to that. So these are the main uh, points, uh, Mr. Chairman, of how GAO has been able to do more work over recent years, how we plan to continue to improve, and I truly think that GAO uh, is one of the really fine institutions in government and we uh, want to serve the Congress 
And we want to serve both sides of the aisle, both the Democrats and the Republicans. We'd be pleased to answer any questions. And you will in about five minutes. We are recessed until the end of this vote. Committee will come to order, Mr. Klinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, General Bowser. Thank you for uh, appearing here and for your testimony. Uh, and I, th I hope, at least, that uh, this uh, hearing and the one that will follow on Thursday is going to be constructive in terms of uh, addressing some of the issues that have been raised. I think it's helpful to you and to us uh, to have uh, hopefully periodic reviews of what goes on so that these uh, uh, problems that arise and concerns that people have can be addressed on a, on a, on a fairly timely basis and not be allowed to fester and become uh, um, perhaps larger than they should be. Let me talk about uh, the, I think the thing that has struck me is two things. One, the enormous increase in the number of reports which GAO does, uh, almost an exponential increase over recent years. Uh, secondly, the fact that uh, so many of those reports are now initiated from the Congress. In other words, there's been a, almost a total flip-flop between what the agency itself uh, initially was doing, 70 percent were being initiated by the agency itself, and the, the real thought that the work product was, uh, was more credible and that the investigations were more meaningful and uh, had greater significance than we do now where we have 70 uh, percent initiated by or 82 percent initiated by the, uh, by the uh, Congress uh, and we get into some peripheral and perhaps not as important thing. And I guess the uh, corollary to that is that I frankly think that you do too much. I mean, I think we are overwhelmed uh, with material uh, and uh, the question is can we possibly absorb or use it all or is it really all very productive? A kind of a rambling question, but could you, uh, is that a concern that you have, that uh, would you like to get back to the point where you were doing more of the work initiated uh, yeah. internally? No, I think that um, uh, statistic is misleading, to be very honest with you, uh, Mr. Klinger. In other words, uh, the history goes something like this, that uh, when Elmer Stotts became uh, Controller General in 1966, GEO was doing uh, work um, for Congress about 15 percent of the time was their request. And he worked uh, that uh, he thought it was not enough. He thought the Cong that GAO should be working more on the issues that uh, uh, Congress was concerned about. And he put in a planning process that um, uh, started to have GAO people think about what were the important work in their issue area and to consult with the Congress. And as a result of that, and uh, in working with the committees, why about 40 percent of the work was requested by Congress when he left office and I came into office. Now, it's interesting that back there in the 1960s, a, a new member of Congress, uh, one of your colleagues, Mr. Horn, wrote a book about uh, the Appropriations Committee, and he said in his book that he thought that GEO's work should be uh, more closely tied uh, to the Congress than uh, uh, what it was. Uh, when I came into office, I strengthened the planning process. I also strengthened the quality review process. So I think the, the work that we're doing today is more relevant uh, than what uh, we were doing uh, when we were self-initiating more of the work. One of the reasons is we consult with so many different people before we work up our plans, and, and that includes many of the people in the universities, in the industry, private sector, uh, and certainly the congressional committees. Uh, once we have those plans available and ready, we then discuss our work with the um, uh, committees. And so a lot of the requests come in from the committees because they see that we have a very good plan and this is the important work. Lots of it is our thinking as much as it is the uh, committee. So it's very hard to decide whether is it 20 percent that's being self-initiated or is it 80 percent. The important thing, though, I do believe, is that the Controller General and the GAO must always have the capability to self-initiate some work. Uh, 
because uh, I would never want, some people have uh, argued in recent years that uh, we should give up the self-initiated work. Uh, it, I would disagree with that uh, completely. I think it's important to have a certain percent. But it doesn't, it doesn't upset you that the balance has, has it, it doesn't upset me at all that the balance has moved towards 80%, uh, because I truly believe that our planning process and the GAO people are having a major influence on what is the important work. And that's what I charge all my issue area directors in putting together their plans, is come up with the important work. And now as we downsize, we will be doing a considerably uh, smaller body of work. Uh, we have known now since um, February of two years ago that we were on this freeze and we were coming down in size. And of course, with the early out, we're coming down fairly drag. So I've asked my division leaderships to bring down the number of reports uh, and the assignments we've accepted. And we've been doing that fairly successful. I wasn't sure how successful it would be, but we've been doing that quite successfully here the last six months, and in two of my major divisions, which I checked on yesterday to get ready for this hearing, we're down about 15 percent on the volume of uh, reports that we're doing uh, uh, by just working with the committees and explaining to them that we can't do as many as what we've done in the past couple of years when we were probably 500 people larger than what we're going to be. Well, it seems, I mean, uh, you know, there are 535 uh, very important people up here, but not all the ideas we have are that important. <laughs> I mean, how do you, how do you, you've got to prioritize this thing somehow. Yeah, absolutely. Priority. Uh, how do you prioritize it? I mean, the, the accusations made, well, you prioritize in favor of the majority. Yeah, and, we, do, we don't. In other words, we prioritize them, we hope, in, in favor of uh, what's the more important work. That's what we're trying to do. And we'd love to get, as I said earlier, more bipartisan requests and more requests from the uh, minority party because I'm sure that there's important work that needs to be done. And we do see, like Congressman Leach was here, we're, we have an excellent working relationship with him over on the banking committee. And, uh, and that would be my model for, for the other committees. In other words, that we can work with both the majority and the minority on each committee trying to figure out what's the important jobs that GAO should be doing. Where is the biggest fraud, waste, and abuse potential? We should be looking at that. Where are the programs that are not effective? Where are the programs that have great cost overruns? Where are the programs that really need to be looked at? That's the kind of dialogue we need with the committee leadership, uh, and that's what we try very hard to do. One of the uh, concerns that have been expressed about the changing role of GAO is that, you know, some years ago, the agency was r largely and primarily on audits and, uh, uh, you know, pretty much uh, nuts and bolts, figures, uh, that sort of thing. You've changed more to a performance kind of audit, policy reviews, which obviously is going to get you into more contentious areas as you uh, weigh this. Uh, what, you know, the things like, the things that have been criticized are the transition and the high-risk series reports, which uh, uh, have been charged with being biased or uh, self-serving well, or whatever. Do you, yeah. I mean, how do you defend against that kind of a claim? Should you be as, should you go deeper into these policy matters? Well, we go basically into the policy and the program areas as we find um, dollar uh, problems. In other words, uh, a lot of our work is driven uh, by the dollars. Where are the big problems? Where are the big dollars in the federal government? When you're looking at a federal government that spends a trillion six, you have a lot of uh, programs that have some big dollars in it. And uh, those are the ones that we study and restudy uh, and that. And uh, lots of times, as you find problems, like take the student loan situation, we're losing about three to four billion dollars a year in the student loan program. Then you've got to get in and figure out what's the program, how's it working, and everything like that. What are some of the problems? Uh, and uh, it was the same on the SNL. In other words, uh, well, for years, we just did a financial audit of the FDIC fund and the FISLIC fund, which was for the SNLs, and we did very little work in the banking area of, of this country because it basically was in the private sector and, and it was in good shape, and the insurance funds were growing every year. Once those funds started to disappear, then the banking committee started asking us why, what's happening, and we started going out and taking a look and reporting and things like that. You then had to get into some of the banking uh, programs as to what was happening and uh, what was ca causing this. And, uh, and so lots of times when we're going into program and policy issues, it's because there's some dollar problems that are, are being identified and we've got to figure that out. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Chairman, I think my time has expired, but I might ask unanimous consent that all members might have uh, time to submit written questions uh, for, the, for the record. Uh, without objection, so ordered. And thank you very much, Mr. Klinger. Uh, Mr. Al McCandless. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bowser and the other members of your staff here, my comments are not meant to be derogatory or inflammatory, but uh, I don't share some of the thoughts that uh, have been shared here this morning by some of my colleagues with respect that as far as the office and concern that every day and every way we're getting better and better and that we don't have some problems. And one of the concerns I have is who audits the GAO, and that seems to be a question mark that is yet to be answered. Let me talk a little bit about could I, could I answer it? Cer certainly. Uh, Mr. Congressman, in other words, uh, that concerned me when I came into office, so I boarded a technique that we used at Arthur Anderson uh, to have a, a group come offline every year and audit our work uh, and see whether we're meeting our standards and everything like that. So it's an internal once a year review that uh, uh, I board. Uh, it's I, not enough, though. Uh, you, have, you have stated that in your comments. Yeah. I, now, have, I have a very limited amount of time, so maybe I ought to focus a little better on my question because it didn't address that part of oh, all right. the activity. The nuts and bolts, for example, what guidelines have been established to determine whether uh, or not agency travel is official? and necessary to accomplish a mission of GAO. Uh, can you tell me the rules that GAO has with regard to mixing pleasure and business, personal business? Uh, the expenditures of uh, certain monies for consultants uh, that um, have some questionable, at least in the minds of those who read the reports, some questionable value in terms of developing your staff and so forth. Um, that's the kind of oversight or audit or review process that I had reference to. Yeah. All right. Um, we, we have uh, policies on, on all of that, and I'd be willing to submit those for the record. Uh, and, and, but let me just say that we also have an internal audit uh, function at uh, GAO that does audits. We also have an annual CPA audit by the um, outside firm, which currently is uh, Pete Marek. Uh, was Price Waterhouse for five years, and uh, and we try very hard to uh, adhere to um, uh, proper legal and ethical um, uh, standards on uh, on all that. As far as the choice of consultants, why um, uh, this is something that uh, we uh, uh, have a large number of consultants to GAO. We are not like OTA, where where people are uh, brought in as a consultant group and they write the report. The GAO report is, um, in the final analysis, a GAO product, but we do seek uh, counsel from a lot of uh, people. A lot of them actually give their service to us um, pretty much uh, on a pro bono basis. Many of them are former uh, uh, government officials and educators. Let me interrupt you if I may, Mr. Bowser, because I have a limited amount of time and I'd like to maximize. You've, yeah. an you've answered generally a question. And what I would like to also do is submit to you uh, specific questions for hopefully specific answers would you please? Uh, rather than take the time of the uh, committee. I would like to review with you what I would refer to as an internal management issue with the general approach to the product that you have. In reviewing any of the Blue Book reports, uh, each report is supported by a team of four or five managers, uh, all supervising one basic evaluator and the fact that the management chain at GO is somewhat impressive. For most jobs, it appears that the management chain goes uh, something along the lines, and this has been written down so I can quote it, uh, <clears throat> evaluator plus evaluator in charge plus assignment manager plus assistant director plus deputy issue area director, issue area director plus assistant controller general plus planning and reporting plus office of general counsel plus office of the chief economist. Uh, now these are quite a number of various layers of review and supervision. Uh, undoubtedly they provide a measure of quality control. But at what, what point uh, 
do the systems overload and management overwhelm productivity? Well, I, I think, uh, Mr. McCandless, as you can see from our statistics, our productivity has increased uh, quite dramatically here. And one of the ways we've achieved it is we've been trying to reduce those layers. I went to a different classification system that's more like a professional organization rather than historic um, government. And uh, under the TQM approaches that we're still trying to improve our sound, we are trying to flatten that uh, pyramid, and so I think your point is well when taken. Did you, when did you start this process? Uh, we started um, the banding, I think, four years ago. Uh, we started the uh, TQM process in 1990, and, uh, this, and what I've quoted then is no longer in in activity and no longer in in as a part of your activity. Um, all of those titles there today are not being used. They were say six years ago. That's correct. And so we are, are in the process of reducing the number, but uh, sometimes on some of the larger reports or something like that, it would go through a, um, uh, a right. pretty high-level review. My, my last question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have had comments from uh, employees over at GAO that uh, jobs have gone on for months and years while people twiddled their thumbs awaiting uh, some type of a signal from management. And even top management doesn't seem to realize that no work is actually being done, even though time charges are being made for each pay period. And uh, this, is, this is the uh, sum total of the system that I've outlined to you, that people are waiting for some type of direction. Uh, either, well, we need to do this to add to the report, we need to just take away from the report. So, as it has been explained to me, these people are in limbo until such time as, uh, as a report that they have been working on reaches a point where management is telling them do this or do that in addition to what their original job was. Uh, we have had a problem of um, what we refer to as parking of reports because we are handling so many different jobs. And so sometimes uh, uh, we do get in the situation where the, the progress is not being made on reports, and that's an you know, area that we want to correct. In other words, that's, a, that's one of our problems, and it's one of the areas we're working on through this TQM process. Uh, and it's, it's a problem that is uh, endemic, I think, of this type of work as far as report, uh, um, studies being done, reports being generated. And uh, it's one that all the professional firms now in the private sector and the public sector, I think, are trying to work through the uh, TQM process and see if we can't uh, improve that, which I'm quite sure we can. So it ha the, the problem that you speak of and has been reported to you has been a long time problem at GAO. And it's one that we have, uh, I think, um, made some real progress in the last year or two, but one that we need to make more progress on. Thank you. Some of the questions I'm going to be submitting to you deal with what I consider to be the necessity of particularly your department to be squeaky clean in its individual and collective activities relative spending of the taxpayers' money. Uh, rather than to, to comment on that, I would want to get your side of the issue sure. because there are always two sides. Sure. We'd be and, pleased uh, to do that. I, I would not want to make public things unless there was a response. So we will be submitting to you uh, some individual and particularly agency activities by management and why were these done and, and what uh, justify the use of taxpayers' money. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. McCandless. Subcommittee Chairman, Mr. Sina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Voucher, you know, there's a longstanding policy in this committee that we do not request <coughs> official written agency comments to GAO reports. I think you know we get a lot of agencies that start squealing like stuck pigs because they want to get a chance to inject their self-serving, often misleading comments to the reports. I am correct, am I not, that these agencies, even when that request is made, still get a detailed exit conference with your agency with respect to the facts of that report, and you make adjustments where they are justified. That's correct, uh, Mr. Sinar. We work very hard to have that exit interview to make sure that the agency um, uh, has their day in court, you might say, and we certainly try to reflect any changes that we think uh, should be made. 
Uh, I might also point out that occasionally, sometimes, the higher-ups in, in the agencies do not come to those uh, exit conferences and then later on claim that they uh, didn't have an opportunity. But we work very hard to make sure that they're aware of it, that uh, we, uh, we want to get their comments. We don't want to uh, uh, issue a report without uh, having their input. All right. Now, another one of the complaints that we hear, particularly from the Department of Energy and Interior, is the duplication of work. Uh, they say that a large portion of your work uh, duplicates what the inspector generals are doing. You do coordinate with the inspector generals to try to minimize that problem, don't you? Yes, we absolutely do. You know, every audit organization, I don't think, um, uh, in the private or the public sector, goes forward with an audit without checking to see if previous audits have been done in that area. We, we make a special effort to work with the IGs because we know that they're working in a lot of these uh, program areas, and uh, we do it two ways. We, we share our program at the beginning of the year with them and to see if there's any conflicts, and we actually make adjustments to which work will go forward. Then as we do individual jobs, why we uh, also check out, and of course if they've done work in that area and we still think we should be doing it, uh, a further review, we then rely lots of times on the work they did. So we try very hard not to duplicate that, and that's just good auditing practice. I might also say we do the same with our sister organizations, CBO, CRS, and OTA, so that we're trying very hard not to have any duplicate effort here uh, by the oversight groups. Now, one of the things the Department of Energy is notorious about moaning about is that uh, you all take up so much time and staff that they can't get anything done. They are quoted in saying, that one GAO study initiated every three days, unquote. You know, I'd point out for the record that the Department of Energy has a $20 billion a year budget, which is about $165 million every three days. And given the inherent problems that, that agency has, maybe you ought to do more oversight than less. But the point is, is that isn't it true that a large number of the studies uh, cited by the Department of Energy in fact, about half of them are not DOE-specific investigations, and they're basically questionnaires and don't involve an extensive amount of work. That's correct. I think uh, when people uh, wrote that information back, they were not playing fair as far as what is the real workload here, uh, because often we are, we are looking at some problem across government. We have to get the input from several agencies, and we'll send out a questionnaire or we'll have an interview or something like that, but it doesn't indicate a full-fledged audit at all. Well, let me get tough on you. One of the things that all of us who serve as subcommittee chairman complain about with GAO is the inability of your people to put into direct, strong <laughs> language. We frequently think that every report you send us should be entitled, Progress Has Been Made, Further Improvement Is Needed, when in fact, when you look at the program that you've just analyzed, the title should basically be, Program Still Stinks, Let's Fire Everyone. When are we going to get you all uh, to be more direct? And I think that's important because with this recent criticism that you're getting, that this hearing uh, really is pointing to and others, the last thing we need to do is to create a group of gun-shy GAO specialists down there that are not willing to present tough, hard reality uh, to Congress in order for us to make uh, good decisions. Well, I think um, it's absolutely essential that GAO um, speak very plainly, be very direct, and call the tough shots. So when think, are you going to start doing that? Well, I think we do it a lot of times. I know sometimes you, you think we don't do it, but if you think of how we handled the SNL crisis, how we've handled the budget deficit, how we've handled many of the major weapon systems, the nuclear weapon bomb plants and things like that, we've spoke very directly uh, to the Congress as what needs to be done and where are the improvements that need to be done, where are the uh, Thing like that. I recognize that from time to time, we, we, when we put the report together, we might not have picked up all the facts or enough evidence that we think that we can be as decisive as maybe some of the members of Congress would like us to be, but that's part of our quality review process and it's part of the uh, process that we uh, uh, jealously guard. But at the same time, I couldn't agree more with you. We don't want to be gun shy uh, when the facts are there. Let me conclude on something you just mentioned in your last answer, which is quality control. None of us want to sacrifice that, but yeah. I think you need to be sensitive to the fact that a report that's three months late or well, after I the agree. legislation that is written does this institution and the process very little good. Right. 
Are you all trying to work out? Well, we are trying very hard. Uh, and, and again, I come back to this uh, quality management improvement effort that we uh, have in place. Uh, you know, we, we produce certain products. Uh, we produce testimonies, letter reports, briefing reports, full chapter reports. We've had the problem for many, many years in, in the timeliness of our work and, and, and the processes that we go about it. And we know that, and we are now trying hard, very hard to get that straightened out. On our briefing reports, one of our divisions now has worked out the process, so when they give the briefing, they will have, within seven days, the report to the committee. They are actually doing it in three or four days most of the time. I'm trying now to see if the rest of my divisions can adopt that, which I think they can, and we hope by the spring that that will be just uh, a general policy and successful pr uh, procedure for all our briefing reports coming out. Now, we also do an excellent job on testimony. And I was just in the San Francisco office, and I saw how we now can work with the new technology. In other words, my San Francisco team was working with my Washington team with the video conferencing and the computers talking together, not any paperwork having to be sent back and forth. And in a matter of hours, we agreed on what the testimony was. See, that's the future GAO. And we're going to be a very timely organization here. Uh, after many years of maybe not having our processes as well as they could have been. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Steiner. That's probably because you weren't getting annual review by government operations. I suspect now. that's right, Mr. Chairman. But <laughs> we'll, we'll all correct that. We'll be happy to. Mr. Craig. I think I've got three minutes here before <laughs> I have to go vote. Um, may I first, Mr. Chairman, enter this letter into the record? This is a letter that we wrote earlier about the uh, reinventing government in, in the White House. And, uh, Without objection, the gentleman from Wyoming's uh, letter will be entered. You know, uh, we've talked a lot, but a lot of these things we talk about, but things don't happen, like getting the members of a committee informed of a study. I have one here that just happened a month ago. It came here 30 days later, the day before the hearing, we heard about it as the ranking member and the minority. You know, now, what are you going to do about that? Instead of, you know, we shouldn't just keep talking about it. Isn't there a remedy? Well, you know, we, um, we don't have this problem with most committees and subcommittees. Well, I don't think that's true. You've heard it several times here today. Yes. And, and one of the problems is, and I, I know the situations that I heard today, was where the uh, chairman of the committee and the ranking minority didn't get along. And so there was not a willing, willingness no. to share. We get caught in the middle then. Uh, what well, I would like to do Why don't you recommend a remedy? Why don't we quit talking about it and figure out some way to do it? Well, I'd like to, if I could. If well, I could get Congress to agree, and that's, you know, sometimes hard with But you don't have any suggestion. Well, we do have some suggestions. What? And we have raised a suggestion of, of maybe having uh, a, a, um, a more limited uh, embargo time frame, uh, uh, proper notification. Well, well I suggest you do it, you know. For yeah. Let's do it once. What about the priorities? How are you going to do that? You agree that you need priorities. You say you go to the big bucks. The big bucks aren't in grazing. You've spent half your life in grazing. That's not where the big dollars are. So that isn't, that isn't, yeah, but th there's that's a, not your criteria. Yeah. Well, it is one of our criteria. Uh, Why don't you use it then? Well, we, we do, I think. Uh, I don't agree with that. And the evidence isn't there that that's true. Well, I, I think we have a list of criteria, which I will send over to you. I How wish you would. You yeah. What about some other system of, 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 of selecting priorities? Well, well we have uh, considered those over the years, like the OTA board is one that, uh, and like that. The only problem with that s system is it gets a small board in between all the committees requesting their uh, I understand. work. And but the question is, will the members on that board be willing to, to review the volume of work that we do? I mean, OTA does about 12, 15 uh, jobs a year. Uh, we're doing 1,000. I understand. And so I take home every uh, weekend, and my top people do too, at GAO, uh, all the request letters, all our own self-initiated, and we really review that stuff every weekend. Can I get a, a leadership board here at GAO, at uh, Congress, that's willing to do that? Uh, that's one of the possibilities. But I guess my frustration is, and I understand part of it, we just yeah. go over and over and over these same things, and you come to the committees, we've done this study five times, nothing's happened, nothing's happened. We ought to, you know, I guess, 
If I have any frustration in being a part of government, and you must too, is my God, we talk and talk and talk yeah. and never do anything. And everyone's so glib, they got all the answers, they agree, and a year from now we'll be doing the same thing, in my view. Well, one of my great frustrations is, is that if Congress could act more on some of the GAO recommendations and the issues that we bring up in our reports, I think we could save a lot of money. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I suppose I better go vote. I, you know, I appreciate your work, and I know the difficulty of it, but I do, you know, we tried to talk to you about something last year. For instance, do you keep a log of all your contacts with the staff of the, of the committees where you're doing this? We keep a, uh, we, um, we keep a, uh, contact memorandum. Uh, Do you really? Uh, yeah. We tried to get them last year and they, they weren't available to us. Well, it's one that we have not shared with uh, people because we feel that a lot of the confidential... Uh, and a lot of it has influence on the outcome of your studies, doesn't it? Uh, it, it um, we, we are influenced by everybody we talk How to. How do you insulate study. yourself from that? By well, policy? We, we don't try to insulate ourselves well, because the important thing for us is to take input from everybody but, yeah, and from then everybody. sort it out. Yeah. I'm a little yeah. impatient with that because you don't get any input. I was on the subcommittee last year that you were very active in yeah, here in this committee. You didn't ever talk to us. Never. Well, we, we should have. Yes, you should have. Yeah. But <laughs> next year it'll be the same answer. Oh, I think we'll uh, make sure that I next year not. will be different. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Craig Thomas, please, I understand your frustration, but remember, there's never been an oversight of GAO. This is the first time, and, and we'll be working. The, what you have is a cumulative frustration buildup that's uh, <laughs> gone across a Do you have any dozen years. Do you have a remedy for that, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Pills annual, an, not pills, yeah. but annual oversight. <laughs> Okay. See, if we, if we cut this process down to every year a review, you're going to feel better in the morning after these uh, annual oversights <laughs> because we'll have these, these uh, activities to, to, uh, to review. I'm, uh, I am venting a little, and the general's been very, very cordial and has come, and we've talked. We've talked. And, uh, and they're very, but I just, just get yeah. damn tired of ne nothing happening then as a result, and so I hope it does. I, I, think, I think you'll be pleased about what's going to uh, happen between now and next year, because they've, they've taken prodigious notes of this entire <laughs> proceeding. Uh, they've got a fair number of people here, so uh, I, I think uh, help is on the way. Good. All right. The, uh, the uh, chair recognizes Chris Shays and asks him to uh, uh, chair the meeting until uh, the chair until can the next debate. Democrat gets back. Yes. <laughs> uh, th that was a decision made by the American people, Chris. It, it I, I wasn't, have no complaint. It wasn't personal. <laughs> I, uh, Mr. Bowser, it's nice to have you here. And I, I, you. I'm thinking that um, uh, it's difficult to, to really get into some of the issues in five minutes and so on. But let me, um, let me say, to start with, uh, I didn't make opening comments that I, I think the GAO does a very good job in, in a number of instances, and I think it probably doesn't do as well as it should in, in, in others. And I'd really want to focus in on uh, just a few of those, if I could. Um, I, was, uh, I, I agree with a lot of what Mr. Dingle said, but when he said that Mr. Lightfoot was right and then went on to the next question as it related to the White House, I felt like he didn't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole. Um, can you tell me the practice of, of uh, the GAO in terms of, of a preliminary draft? Is it the practice to give the preliminary draft to the parties that you're investigating, looking at, at auditing, and so on? We, we do it uh, both ways. Uh, sometimes we give the, the uh, draft, and uh, if we're getting agency comments, uh, if we are not getting agency comments, uh, we then have what's known as an exit interview when we sit down and go through with them the, um, uh, all the facts we have found and discuss it, but we don't le leave a document with them. And needless to say, one of the reasons why um, many of the committees do not want us to take the time and get the agency comments is the problem of leaks. And in this case, why uh, the leak happened. And uh, I'm, I'm less concerned about the leak, candidly. Yeah. What I'm concerned about is knowing what the policy is and to, to know if you follow it, uh, it, it as a general rule. It's the policy that, in a, that you have a investigative reports, in this case it was pretty sensitive, and that you 
just provide it to, to the group that's being audited to, to respond to it? Uh, we have, over the years, um, uh, provided um, uh, drafts of reports uh, when we were getting uh, what we called formal agency comments, which we would then... Uh, How often does that happen? About 50% of the time. No. It would I think seem so. Ac actually, in terms of the policy, it's not one that is universally followed by rote. <clears throat> if we think agency comments are important to have, uh, we will, that is, agency comments on a draft report. We will provide that draft report to the agency. In well, some cases, when we do work for a particular requester, we are precluded from doing that, in which case we would have a very lengthy, full discussion with the agency of what our factual basis uh, for reaching our conclusions is. What was, what was the basis for allowing the White House to have, a, have the preliminary? I think the White House is a special case. In both Democratic and uh, Republican administrations, the White House has never been as forthcoming as agencies generally are with, uh, uh, with regard to responding to our requests for information. Most often at the White House, we have to go through a negotiation process to lay down some ground rules as to what we're going to require, how we're going to be able to review it, and ultimately make sure, as far as we're concerned, that we get the information that we need, yeah. uh, while at the same time uh, observing some recognition of the uh, unique status of the White House with regard to our work. Did the White House break the law? No, the White House did not break the law as far as the situation. I assume you're referring to the situation that Congressman Lightfoot uh, raised. What no, did, we do not think what, it did. What did they do that was wrong? <clears throat> what they did that was wrong is more from the standpoint of its administration rather than with regard to any payments that it might have made. The, the, uh, were they following the same practice they would expect uh, the other executive branches to follow? Uh, I suspect not. Okay. Um, so uh, you said they did nothing. So are you being very fine in your description? Are you saying they didn't break any law uh, technically? Uh, but clearly they went well beyond what they would expect other agencies to abide by. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm assuming from your response. Well, I, I think... First, it's important to recognize the extremely broad authority that the White House has with regard to the uh, payments that we were looking at. Let me quote it to you. The President is authorized to appoint and fix the pay of employees in the White House office without regard to any other provision of law regulating the employment or compensation of persons in the government service. In our initial reaction uh, to that language, we were struggling with just the issue that you're raising in the context of how other government agencies would be required to uh, deal with retroactive payments. We finally concluded that the particular transactions that we were looking at were legal, that we had no question about them, but that we considered... No question that they were legal? No question that they were legal. Okay, wh what did you find troubling about the transactions? What we were initially questioning was <clears throat> what the limits of that authority might be. Mm -hmm. How might the White House use that authority in doing something with regard to the pay of personnel that would not be appropriate? And what we concluded here was that the people that we were reviewing who received retroactive uh, payments were actually paid for work that they did and that there was therefore no question that we had. Let me get this straight. They weren't federal employees at the time they did the work. They were working for the White House. And then they were paid after the fact for work they had done when they weren't legally federal employees? No, they were federal employees that 
there are uh, rules with regard to the employment of personnel that made them de facto employees, even though their appointments had not been regularized. Had they been what we concluded under this authority was that with the president having the authority to uh, <clears throat> pay his employees without regard to any other law, which would include any other laws that we in prior decisions uh, would have opined on, that these payments were regular and legal. Uh, and had you determined that this practice had happened uh, consistently in the past? No, we did not. Okay. I just have to tell you what I was hoping you would say, given that you have 5,000 employees and given that you can't do every report well. I was hoping you would say to me, no, we didn't do it as well as we should have. Uh, we, 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 I guess what I'm feeling, I'm feeling uncomfortable is I'm feeling like you're trying to justify something that, that I think is uh, really questionable. No, I, I think that as far as the work itself was concerned, that we did establish the legality of the payments that were made, and we got from the White House open recognition that its practices in this regard uh, were not very, very good. Well, I think and they got away with a lot with that admission. I mean, my own judgment is that they're asking the executive branch to abide the other parts of the administration to abide by one policy, and at the same time they were by abiding by another one. And what I was hoping is that you would basically have been candid in saying what you did well and what you didn't do well. What didn't you do well in this report? Uh, I am uh, Jim Hinchman. I'm the general counsel at GAO. Uh, as I tried to explain to Mr. Lightfoot uh, at a hearing last Friday, what I think we did not do well uh, is to come to this work with an adequate appreciation early enough of the special authorities that Congress had granted the president with respect to uh, Title III employees. We came to the work steeped in the complexities of Title V, I may even say proud of our expertise in that area, an enormously complex body of statutory uh, requirements, of regulatory schemes, and GAO uh, decisions. We approached the problems at the White House from that perspective. It was really only later in the work, uh, although I must say prior to the August 27 preliminary draft, which uh, Mr. Lightfoot referred to, that we began to appreciate that because of the breadth of the authority given the president, we really could not say that the White House had acted illegally. The preliminary draft language was intended, as uh, Mr. Sokolar has said, uh, to, to reflect that judgment that we could not say it was illegal, but that we remained troubled about the potential breadth of this authority given the president and its possible implications. Uh, that language in the preliminary draft uh, was not ideal. Uh, it, in fact, changed, as Mr. Lightfoot has pointed out, before we, re we released the formal comment draft. Okay. I, I'm going to, since I have to be fair here, give up my time, sure. <laughs> regretfully, but uh, I just want to reiterate mm -hmm. that with 5,000 employees and all the studies you do, you know, as we go in the store, there's this magnificent stack of your reports that are about, about six feet high. And many of them are looked at, but some aren't. You just have to do too many things. And I just would have, I just don't feel comfortable about that report in any way. I don't think it was candid. I don't think it was sharp. I don't think it was forceful. And, and just as I'm uncomfortable with the report on health care in Canada, I felt it was a, a glossy kind of report with no offense to those who were here who may have been involved in it, but I felt it was enthusiastic for the Canadian system and didn't point out tremendous shortfall in that. And I guess what I was hoping I would hear from you gentlemen today was, you know, we did this well, we didn't do this well, honestly, and if we had to do it over again, we would have done it differently. And really what I feel is, uh, just like any other agency that has to defend its reports against your reports, you're saying, uh, gosh, I relinquish my time to uh, my colleague to the right, Mr. Chairman, I did my job well. I uh, only used five minutes. and. Uh, <laughs> I still have the chair until he takes it away from me. You, you, you just lost it. <laughs> but you did a good job while I was away. I was really proud of you. Uh, Mr. Hastert, the gentleman from Illinois. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
General Bauscher, we appreciate you being with us today. I just want to get this perfectly clear, I guess, as somebody once said, that you said that leaks happen, and that's unfortunate, but they do happen in your operation, and that from the testimony that you passed on to the gentleman to your left and also to the gentleman on your right, that uh, when the draft language was changed <clears throat> from something being terribly wrong uh, in the White House and conferring with the White House but not conferring with Mr. Lightfoot and the change, the language was then changed that said after the leak uh, <laughs> that there wasn't any problem at all, that everything was above board. That's just rudimentary. That's things that happen all the time. Is that correct? Oh, oh, no, I don't think we uh, oh. said that. I think what we've said that they uh, use bad administrative practices. What you have here is that the White House has a, a, it comes under a different law. And what we said in the report is that we think Congress ought to uh, reevaluate whether they want to um, have quite as broad, give the, the President quite as broad a uh, uh, leeway with his payroll. But your payroll systems here in the Congress are the same, too. In other words, you come under, I think it's Title Three. Title Title so two. anyway, in final analysis. And, and you don't have the same accountability as the administrative offices in the executive branch, and neither does the White House. So the two groups have uh, more leeway, let's say. But, uh, boy, there's no question, let me uh, make it very uh, clear here, that uh, we think everybody should account for their payroll properly uh, in all parts of government. Well, I, I, my time's limited, and I, I just wanted to get a, a straight answer from the general. Yeah. Uh, the second issue is uh, health care. You mentioned that, that your agency has a real uh, role in the future to look at health care. I, I was here when you presented, uh, General Bauscher, your health care report on Canadian system, single-payer system, rather yeah. glowing report on Canada. Um, and I'm sure you put a lot of research in it, but, as, uh, you know, that report still being used today and saying we're talking about 70 billion, 70 some billion dollars worth of savings. But I always also failed to see the situations, for instance, in Ontario, Canada, where uh, you have a 38 to 58 percent marginal tax, a 15 percent value added tax, a payer check off, uh, pay, an employer check off, payroll check off, and uh, that last fiscal year in 92, uh, they spent $17.5 billion for payroll and only brought in $7.5 billion. I didn't see those types of analysis in it. Was that just an oversight, or did you only look on one side of the ledger? No, we looked at the uh, complete system at that time, and um, I think one of the things that uh, some people have overlooked is we did uh, point out some of the problems with the Canadian system in that report. In other words, uh, it... Uh, it did have the uh, main, one of the main points was the uh, uh, very high administrative costs uh, that we have in our system today versus what they have under their single payer. But we also pointed out that they have a, a lot of queues that have uh, built up as far as people getting uh, their service as, as quickly as maybe they would like. Uh, they have uh, probably underinvested in some of the technology, so they can't do quite the, uh, some of the um, procedures, an American thing like that. So we had many other issues in there. Some people quote, you know, a lot of time when we issue a report, people will quote one thing that they think buttresses their arguments. Other people will quote something else that buttresses their arguments. It's called cherry picking. It happens yeah, here cherry a lot. Picking. Uh, <clears throat> General, you made a, a statement a little while ago, and it says, you know, one of your goals is to look at the fraudulent uh, fraud, waste, and abuse in the system. Yes. Uh, and it certainly you commented that in your organization, in your operation, that you police yourself from with, you have a set-aside group of people and police yourself from the outside. I, I want to ask you some questions that I'd like to just have some quick answers. And, and you have a driver, is that correct? Well, I, I drive myself most of the time. In other words, by law, I'm authorized a driver, but I drive myself back so and forth. So you didn't have a, a driver in 1992 whose base salary was 35490 He is the head of our motor uh, pool, All right. and uh, he, like, he drives me over today for this hearing and things like that. Uh, and we, um, uh, we have to move a lot of people every day from GAO to the Capitol to where our rented space are and everything like that. We also are not in the best neighborhood, and so we have a shuttle that, that uh, operates up to 8 o'clock at night so that our people can get to the subway and to other places like that. 
And so he heads all that up, and much of his overtime uh, is involved in just scheduling, managing the cars, and that. He's not driving me home. Now, he did more so in 92, but it's, it's starting in... So uh, it's changed. Yes, So the changed. 978 hours of overtime in 92 yeah. are, won't be there in 93, is that correct? Uh, well, I'm not sure with the overtime, but I'm driving myself. Let me put it that way, so Mr. That's, Hess. That's a good change. Yeah. And uh, so the, the base salary then of uh, $60,585 uh, uh, probably won't be there this year? Well, I have to check. Okay. Uh, do you have a chef? Uh, we have uh, two people that uh, serve food in, in, in our dining um, Do they cook the food? Rooms. They cook the food, yes. And, and serve it. And serve it, yes. And a base salary of $30,500? I believe that's right. Uh, and a bonus of $650? Last year, 92? I don't think he got a bonus. Okay. Maybe overtime? Uh, we have that information, yeah. he does. And while overtime was actually 441 hours at a cost of $9,418. Do you agree with that? That sounds about right. And you ju you think you need somebody to prepare food and serve food? It, it's very cost effective because what we are able to do is to bring a lot of these consultants, advisors in and uh, meet with them and, uh, and they um, uh, give us a lot of good advice and uh, opinions and that on uh, various issues. We also use it to um, uh, meet with some of the heads of the agencies uh, from the executive branch. I have many uh, uh, meetings at lunchtime and at breakfasts with uh, people in the executive branch and that, and I bring in my top team in that area. So what we're doing is we're turning conference rooms into uh, the ability to serve the food and have business meetings. We have no executive dining room. In other words, we have no place where our top executives go every day and have a, a, a meal. But we do have these business meetings uh, and we, uh, we find it very cost effective. So you don't think this is excessive for an entity whose mission is to identify waste, fraud, and abuse? I, I really don't. Uh, we're looking at the overtime to see if we can't cut that down. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Chris Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to return just briefly to our discussion about the GAO report on retroactive uh, payments to people who later became staffers at the White House. Uh, what I understood uh, the uh, uh, witnesses to say is that uh, there is a different law governing uh, this circumstance than would govern other cases where the GAO might be asked to look at uh, retroactive payments to employees and so on. Is there a different law concerning sharing draft GAO reports with the White House on the one hand and with ranking members of congressional committees on the other hand? Because my understanding is that the GAO shared the draft report with the White House, which was the subject of the investigation, but did not share it with the ranking member of the committee that requested the report. Is there a different law that applies to the White House and to the ranking member who requested it in terms of GAO's ability to provide that report? There is no different law. Uh, nor is there a good reason for that to have been done in this case, for Lightfoot to have been excluded? No, and in fact, as you know, uh, once we understood that situation, Mr. Lightfoot was given a copy of the report that was appropriate. He should have had it. But how much time had intervened? I do not know precisely how long that was. Uh, what had happened is... Well, the report that he eventually saw, as I heard him testify this morning, was one that had already been altered from the draft that was provided to the White House. No, Mr. Lightfoot received all copies of all drafts of that report, of which there were three. But by the time that took place, the, the report had already been altered, isn't that right? I am not certain of precisely the sequencing. I thought that he received the preliminary draft, as it was called, after a few days. There was some confusion in the beginning, but that then that was straightened out when he made a personal phone call, as he said, uh, and he got a copy. I've shared with the Comptroller General in private conversation my experience with uh, a GAO report on NASA and the space station. I was the ranking member on the subcommittee that requested the report, but I was not apprised that the report had been requested. Uh, it was not uh, GAO's policy to let the ranking Republican know. Uh, and in fact, not only was I kept in the dark until the moment of the hearing, uh, but so too was the, the head of NASA, Admiral Truly, who came 
to the hearing with a lot of press, and he was supposed to defend himself against this report, but he didn't have the opportunity to read it. The report was described in material part in that morning's Washington Post, even though I hadn't seen it and the chairman or the, the head of NASA hadn't seen it. Uh, it strikes me that the White House getting a draft copy of the report is very different than uh, what GAO has done in other cases. Um, Mr. Cox, we, you go back to the situation where um, we uh, try to work um, with the agencies as we are uh, doing the reports. And we have two procedures there. One is to um, yeah, get official agency comments, and to do that, we do give them a draft of the report. Uh, if we do not do that, uh, we then have this exit conference. And at that point, why we try to get their input and things like that. Then we try to finalize the report after that point. Where we get into problems uh, is where somebody um, is going to be clever and leaks the report. And then we've got a document out there that is uh, uh, floating around and, uh, and you know, we try to be fair to everybody at that point, but sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's not a very uh, uh, even process, you might say. We're just trying to cope with what the situation is. Uh, and that was the situation in this White House uh, situation. We were not trying to uh, keep anything from Congressman Lightfoot. We were just going through our normal procedures. And if the people had not leaked the report, why, we would have um, uh, been able to issue our report uh, in, in our normal procedure. Uh, on the uh, NASA job there, w we had uh, notified the, the Congress with our uh, regular notification that that job was in, in uh, um, place and everything like that. I think at the time, the, the uh, chairman of your subcommittee and you uh, were not maybe in the best of communications, and uh, and we were delivering the report to the uh, chairman, and uh, in most cases, that would have been delivered on over to you. In that case, apparently, it wasn't. And uh, but, but we, in we in no way were trying to keep it uh, from you. But it, except that uh, because I've had both written and oral communication with yeah. GAO on the subject, my understanding is that uh, GAO left it up to the committee chairman to provide it to me, and GAO would not have undertaken itself to provide me directly with that report, which is why I didn't get it. Uh, and, and it strikes me the White House situation is even more unusual because it was the ranking member who'd requested the report. So in that case, even the, the member of Congress who requested the report was kept in the dark, while the agency, which is the subject of the investigation, uh, was uh, cut in on the inside. Can I add one further note to that? Uh, obviously, the, the, we didn't do this uh, as we would now do it in retrospect. What happened is this. The first draft that was given the White House was not a draft for formal agency comment. It was a so-called preliminary draft. Its purpose was to get some initial uh, verification of some of the facts as we described them and to get some additional information from the White House regarding some cases which we didn't fully understand at that point. We did not think of that as being a formal agency comment draft and therefore didn't invoke the routine practice of providing the requester of the work with a copy at the same time. That was really the difficulty. Uh, once Mr. Lightfoot, once it leaked and he, and he raised the question about uh, why he didn't have a copy, then we did get one to him. I should add that uh, before I was in Congress, I worked in the White House as a lawyer, and I've been on the other end of this. I've been on the other end of GAO investigations of the White House. Uh, it would have been highly unusual and did not occur in the GAO investigations in which I was involved uh, to get a draft copy of the report. We would have killed to have one. Uh, let me uh, ask a, a second question because Congressman Dingell brought this up. Uh, the, the law requires, uh, at least it did uh, last year uh, and in previous years, that uh, GAO conduct uh, routine audits of independent councils. Uh, no such audit was conducted uh, of uh, Lawrence Walsh for several years, and so I signed a letter along with uh, some other members of Congress uh, asking that GAO live up to its statutory responsibility, which subsequently you did. Uh, today, Congressman Dingell testified with information provided to him, I have to guess, by the GAO, that I had requested a GAO report when, in fact, all I did was uh, ask GAO to fulfill its statutory responsibility to provide a report. Uh, isn't this an example of having uh, too many detailees working for committee chairmen so that uh, a committee chairman can come up here and uh, uh, testify in support of GAO 
uh, using information provided to him by the, uh, and I don't know that this is exactly how it happened in this yeah. case, but uh, uh, I don't know how else Congressman Dingell would have gotten a hold of, uh, 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 of information that I had allegedly requested a GAO report, when in fact I hadn't. Uh, he's, he's got more detailees on, on that Energy and Commerce Committee than we have Republican staffers. I mean, isn't this the big change that's happened since the 60s when 10 percent of your reports were instigated uh, by Congress and, and the rest were independent? Now 82 percent are directed by Congress. I mean, isn't GAO nothing more or less than adjunct congressional staff? No, not at all, uh, Mr. Cox. In other words, uh, the reason that he had that information, I believe, is that uh, a lot of different uh, uh, people on this committee and the people that were going to testify asked us for different information, and we've been uh, very good. I think Mr. Klinger would agree that we have provided all the information that we, you have requested of us, and the uh, chairman, too, here. And, uh, and he requested uh, uh, what reports had been issued in uh, 1992, and so we uh, presented that to him, uh, just a, a straight in information request, you might say. Just, just for the record, but, yeah. I wonder if I could ask your assistance in clarifying this. Yeah. The, the report that you provided uh, on the Independent Council was one that the statute required you to oh, do. Oh, absolutely. You didn't and do that because Chris Cox asked for it. No, you're absolutely right. And uh, let me just say that that is one of the few times uh, that we truly did drop the ball on getting requests uh, because we had somebody leave our organization that thought somebody else in our organization had picked up and the responsibility for doing that request and it truly just got lost in our system and so uh, that was a mandated request uh, and you people were reminding us of that. I'd like to conclude and then yield back uh, by uh, uh, focusing on the problem, uh, which you know I'm deeply interested in, of uh, the size and the expense uh, of GAO. Uh, you mentioned that uh, GAO is roughly the same in size since the 1960s, but we know it costs a whole lot more. In fact, uh, uh, during the last uh, few hours I went back and looked and I've, I've found that uh, uh, in 1965, the mid-60s, which you mentioned as a base period during which not much has happened, uh, it cost $46.9 million to run GAO, uh, it's going to cost us uh, around uh, 490 million this year. Adjusted for inflation, that uh, number from 65 would be about 204 million this year. So we have grown uh, from 204 million inflation adjusted from 1965 to 490 million uh, over and above uh, inflation. Uh, that's rather significant growth, isn't it? Uh, it is, and I just don't know. Uh uh, okay. how to explain that because I don't have, have the numbers, but 80 percent of our costs are people costs. In other words, uh, uh, pay increases uh, account for, uh, has to account for a large portion of that, and as I said, the other two uh, significant uh, ingredients after you get past the 75 or 80 percent of our budget is it's basically facilities costs, uh, the building that we're in and the regional offices that we occupy. And then the other is the modern computers, uh, the micros, the laptops, and the network that um, uh, we're putting in. And so um, obviously that's more costly, but then when you see the productivity gains that we've been able to achieve, why you have to then recognize that uh, uh, some of the increased costs has turned into um, a much better output than that. Now, as we're coming down in size here, uh, some of the productivity gains will be actually uh, translated into a smaller uh, organization. Uh, uh, taking the number of employees that GAO has and dividing it into the amount that GAO spends, it works out to be $860,000 per employee in 1993. Oh, I uh, think you missed a digit there. 90,000? 80,000? 80, 90, 80, 90. Is that right? Yeah. 86 to 90,000? All right. Yeah. Well, it's a typo here. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, it's a great deal of money uh, per capita, it strikes me. And I wonder, I didn't know till I got here, uh, and I don't think except as an emblem it's material, uh, about the $60,000 that was spent last year for a driver and the $40,000 that was spent for an executive chef and so on. Would you be uh, uh, supportive of uh, legislation that I know the ranking Republican on the Budget Committee in the Senate has introduced uh, to have an outside audit of GAO? We do have an outside audit of the GAO. It's done every year by a, an outside CPA firm 
Uh, Pete Mark uh, did it this past year, and for the previous five years, it was done by Price Waterhouse. Uh, where does that report go? Because, you know, honestly, I haven't seen it. I didn't That's, know that. That is in our annual report that we send to Congress, and we send a copy of that report to every and member of Congress. And what is the scope of that audit? It's a regular um, CPA audit uh, according to the government auditing standards. So it has the financial statements, it has the internal controls, and it has uh, laws and regulations, the so three major components. And so you think that Senator Domenici's legislation is superfluous? I, I have uh, talked to Senator Domenici, and I've said the big thing we need is a uh, peer review every three years. And uh, they have decided to have this review by the National Academy of Public Administration as the uh, first one. And so I think with the CPA audit, our internal audit, the, um, uh, the peer review every three years, we would then have as much review as any auditing organization mm -hmm. in the whole world. Okay. And, um, and so I would think that that would um, no, do it. I'll see him later. Um, well, I look forward to uh, working with you. As you know, uh, I am very interested in restoring uh, some independence to the GAO. I think one of the reasons uh, that perhaps you weren't able to complete your statutory uh, report for the independent council is that you've got so much other work on your plate. No, in that case, it really wasn't. Uh, we just totally... Uh, when that request came in, we look at all these laws, you know, that are passed every year, and we go through them, and we say, boy, here's a requirement here, and we make a list and everything like that, and we assign them out, and unfortunately in that case, um, it was assigned to one person. He left our organization and, uh, and didn't pass it on, although he said he thought he had passed it on. So it was just something that dropped through the crack. I apologize to the Congress over it. We got right with the job, as you remember. Uh, as soon as it was brought to our attention. And, and it hasn't happened very often in my 12 years, but uh, it certainly did happen there. And, and as I said, I apologize then, I apologize today. But nonetheless, the fact remains that your statutory obligations, uh, the things that GAO is supposed to do on its own, right. in that case uh, fell through the cracks, whereas the congressional demands, which have moved from 10% of your workload to 82%, are in fact getting satisfied because the squeaky well, wheel gets the grease. No, and, but we, and, uh, no, that's not true, Mr. Cox. I'd like to go back. To point out that we get a lot of requests too that you know we can't start. We, we in other words, so we negotiate uh, either away from those jobs and say they're not quite uh, as a high a priority as we think they should be. And we uh, General we, Bowser, uh, could I interrupt, please? Yeah. We, I've been favored by a visit by Mr. Isaac Hayes, a friend and a great jazz artist, and uh, he's in the committee room. And I wanted to take note of it. Now he's going to have to leave, but we're delighted he's here. Welcome. Good to see you. Thank Mr. Chairman, I just add that I bought my first Isaac Hayes album when I was about 14 years old. <laughs> Thank you for permitting that interruption. Uh, I, in fact, I, I think we've come to closure on this, and uh, yeah. uh, I yield back. And I want you to know, Ms. Cox, that I want to work with you here on this issue of uh, the number of reports, the independence and that, because I think you and I are, are trying to achieve the same goal here. And, and, uh, and I want to work with you here in the uh, uh, months ahead to see if we can't come to uh, some agreement. I appreciate that, and I look forward to it. Yeah. General Bowser, have you checked out Isaac Hayes uh, earlier or later? You know, I'm an old trombone program. player from Elkhart, Indiana, so, oh, okay, uh, that, uh, you know, I... <laughs> one hand washes the other. It's <laughs> wonderful to know. Mr. John Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, Comptroller General. Um, as far as the structure is, uh, of your agency is concerned and who you report to, uh, it's my understanding you report to both the Congress for oversight and also for appropriations. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, I read somewhere, is this the first time in eight years that, you, that uh, you, you've appeared before a committee? or? It's the first time that we've appeared for an oversight hearing before this committee in since 1985. But I have an annual hearing, of course, before the Appropriations Committee on both. Uh, so basically... This is your first time in eight years in an oversight capacity before this. Uh, That's correct. This committee. Um, I'm I'm a new member of the Congress and the committee, so I'm a little bit stunned sometimes by the way I find we conduct uh, routine uh, business here. 
You also testified today there's no inspector general within your uh, department. Is that correct? That's correct. What we do have is an internal audit function and an external auditor. Uh, and that audit that was conducted, we have staff here. Uh, what kinds of cre uh, questions have been raised about the audit that's been conducted in the past? Is there a record of questions about uh, specific items in the audit? I'm not sure. Has there ever been? I, I don't. I'd have to check that, uh, Mr. Micah. Uh, let me check that and uh, supply that for the record. But uh, we have had questions from time to time on individual issues, whether it was tied to the um, audit or not, I just don't remember. Well, let me tell you a problem that I have as a minority member. Earlier you heard when we had Mr. Uh, Walker in here, we had the exchange about the, the car and the driver, and uh, for the first time I learned about this and the uh, chef. See, I, I come from, uh, from out there fairly recently, more recently than probably anybody on the dais right now, and people aren't really into, the, the people that I've got elected and, and represent aren't into conducting business as usual. So they have a real problem with the executive chef uh, or, or chef. They have a problem, as you testified before us, of, of paying for lunch for the consultants who the government's in turn paying and, and the drivers for, for staff. You also said cars, and, yeah. and that got me a little bit, uh, you know, raising questions. Now, I, let me just tell you where I'm from. We, we, we've had, when I came here, we had five investigative staff. I think we now have seven or eight. This is the list of our responsibilities for oversight in addition to your agency. It's several pages. And this, has, this is a great committee. It has a great history. It dates back to 1816 in one form or another. But how would you, and you don't have to answer this today, but submit it to the minority if you could. We have those seven or eight investigative staff, and you're pretty creative because you have almost a half a billion dollar budget, 5,055 employees, uh, and you're overseeing a $1.6 trillion budget. We are too in our capacity. How would you uh, divide those, those investigative staff that we have to oversee you and this $1.6 trillion uh, uh, responsibility uh, and the committee acts as the principal oversight committee of all executive branches, agencies, programs, and activity. In light of the fact that we've had testimony at the table that you're sitting and up here from the dais that uh, your agency has not performed in, say, an adequate matter uh, overseeing, say, the White House and some other agencies. So I want you to submit to me how we can best constructively, as a, as a minority, represent those people that we've come here and check on your interest, uh, not learn, you know, just the day of the hearing about what's going on down, uh, down there. Uh, one final question. So if you'd submit that, I appreciate it. Uh, have any of the members been down to visit you at uh, GAO or been through GAO? Yes, some have and some have not, and we'd be pleased to have any about, members come over. And what about staff visits? Uh, yes, we've had staff visits. How about from the minority investigative staff? How long have you? Yes. They have been? Yes. Okay. And you feel the oversight is adequate? No, I, have, uh, I think the oversight by the Congress could be a lot better than the way it is done. And I have uh, given that uh, memorandum to the uh, committee that's looking at the uh, organization of the Congress, and I've said it in many times in testimony that I think, and I said it earlier here today, that what we need is to get the financial records and the financial systems of the federal government in much better shape. They're in terrible shape. Uh, after New York City fiscal crisis, we got the state and the local governments to uh, uh, improve and to be able to have annual audits. And, uh, and I think it's high time that the federal government was able to do that. If we could get that done, and then if we could get some of the program systems improved, the GAO audits could be much more efficient, and I think the oversight hearings could be much better done, and I think you ought to have an annual hearing of every major department in the federal government by the Cognizant Committee, and, uh, and GAO should... Uh, including GAO. Including GAO, and I said that at my confirmation hearing 12 years ago. Well, again, can you imagine the frustration sitting here and dealing uh, with you and uh, 
having a conflicting uh, hearing, you know, at this, this particular time and other oh. business, and not the tools to complete the job to make sure that you, uh, you perform the job yeah. well. well. Well, I think we have put in most of the tools. In other words, when I came to GAO, we were not able to uh, get a clean opinion on an, on an annual audit. But we worked hard on our own accounting, and we uh, have got that, and we have a CPA audit every year. Uh, we, um, we issue an annual report. We issue our performance indicators every year and send them to the Congress. Uh, so we've been reporting regularly to the Congress as to how GAO is doing and, uh, and that. And I don't want to beat a dead horse, but when you do look at your budget in the future, these things are a concern uh, to me and the people that I represent. And we've all been asked to do some belt tightening. And uh, uh, if you see the letters that I get daily from people out there that are struggling to just, you know, make it from day to day, it's hard for me to go back and explain uh, what I learned here today. So uh, take that to heart, please, and also to the, the bottom line when you uh, go to budgeting next time. Thank you. I yield well, and, and I want to assure you that we do that, um, Congressman Mike, because we have been making GEO a much more efficient operation here for all 12 years of my uh, uh, tenure and I will continue. I will be announcing some closures. We've closed about half of our uh, field offices uh, during my uh, uh, 12 years when I get done with, uh, or b before I leave here in the 15 years. We've been reducing now the size of the organization. We've been increasing the productivity. We've been improving the quality review of our reports. So we've been working very hard at uh, making GAO one of the really models of a, of a government agency, and I think we've made a lot of progress. We still have a ways to go on some of the issues, like the process of, um, uh, that we go through. Thank you. I yeah. Relax, I look to you. yeah. Well, Mr. Micah, he only has till 1996 before his term runs out. Of course, he could be reappointed. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> Can't be reappointed. The law is that you cannot be reappointed, mm -hmm. and it's an excellent law. <laughs> so, so, you, so uh, of course, you have to get reelected. So uh, we're, we'll work it out. Mr. Shays for a closing comment. Thank you, Mr. Boucher. Um, the thing that concerns me about the question that, that uh, Mr. Cox asked about what Mr. Domenici is proposing, he's proposing to a, an or, a, a private auditors and outside experts to review and evaluate the GAO's work. Isn't that, it seems to me what, we're not talking about a CPA audit. We're talking about a, a, just to, to look at all your practices and make recommendations, much as you would do uh, to other agencies. And yes. I, I'd, I'd be, I'm kind of interested that you would be reluctant to... Well, no, to I'm not reluctant to do that. In other words, uh, I'm, I, I'm a great believer in peer review of a professional organizations. And so the government auditing standards require that it be done every three years. And I have told uh, Senator Domenici that I'm in 100 percent agreement on that part of his bill. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And, and I think uh, if I could add, uh, as uh, Milt's reminding me, uh, we are in the process of having the first review by the National Academy of Public Administration, which the Senate is financing. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, and we're looking forward to that. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Sokolar, any closing comments? Not really, no. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, part two, 10 o'clock Thursday. Uh, other members of GAO and uh, other witnesses on the same subject. Thank you for your attendance. The committee stands adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is the first of two days of hearings that the Government Operations Committee is holding to look at the operations and functions of the General Accounting Office. On Thursday, Representatives of two GAO employee groups will present the views of agency entry-level and mid-level employees. A former Comptroller General and other GAO officials are scheduled to testify. Next, a speech by House Republican Whip Newt Gingrich. We have managed and start. Three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia on a life sciences mission for Earth and space.
On October 18th, astronauts aboard Space Shuttle Columbia began a mission to study the long-term health effects of weightlessness. On Sunday, we'll open the phone lines and let you talk with our studio guests and two crew members aboard Columbia about NASA, medical research, and what it's like to be in space. Sunday on C-SPAN, beginning at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific Time. The final touches are being put on the C-SPAN school bus. Next week, it begins a tour of the nation. Its mission, to generate new ideas about how C-SPAN and its programming can be used in classrooms. During the next eight months, our cameras will chart its course, visiting communities and schools across the country. The C-SPAN school bus, educating you about America's electronic town hall.